Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Proverbs 4.23 The heart of man is his worst part before he is regenerated, and the best afterwards. It is the seed of principles and the fountain of actions. The eye of God is, and the eye of the Christian ought to be principally fixed upon it. The greatest difficulty in conversion is to win the heart to God, and the greatest difficulty after conversion is to keep the heart with God. Here lies the very force and stress of religion. Here is that which makes the way to life a narrow way, in the gate of heaven a straight gate. Direction and help in this great work are the scope of the text, wherein we have, first, an exhortation, keep thy heart with all diligence. Number two, the reason or motive enforcing it, for out of it are the issues of life. In the exhortation I shall consider, first, the matter of the duty. Secondly, the manner of performing it. Number one, the matter of the duty. Keep thy heart. Heart is not here taken properly for the noble part of the body, which philosophers call the first that lives and the last that dies. But by heart, in a metaphor, the scripture sometimes represents some particular noble faculty of the soul. In Romans 1.21, it is put for the understanding. Their foolish heart, that is, their foolish understanding, was darkened. Psalm 119.11 It is put for the memory. Thy word have I hid in my heart. In 1 John 3.10, it is put for the conscience, which includes both the light of the understanding and the recognitions of the memory. If our heart condemn us, that is, if our conscience, whose proper office it is to condemn. But in the text we are to take it more generally for the whole soul or inner man. What the heart is to the body, that the soul is to the man. And what health is to the heart, that holiness is to the soul. The state of the whole body depends upon the soundness and vigor of the heart, and the everlasting state of the whole man upon the good or ill condition of the soul. By keeping the heart, we are to understand a diligent and constant use of all holy means to preserve the soul from sin and maintain its sweet and free communion with God. I say constant, for the reason added in the text extends the duty to all the states and conditions of a Christian's life, and makes it binding always. If the heart must be kept, because out of it are the issues of life, then as long as these issues of life do flow out of it, we are obliged to keep it. Lavater on the text will have the word taken from a besieged garrison, beset by many enemies without, and in danger of being betrayed by treacherous citizens within, in which danger the soldiers, upon pain of death, are commanded to watch, and though the expression, keep thy heart, seems to put it upon us as our work, yet it does not imply a sufficiency in us to do it. We are as able to stop the sun in its course, or to make the rivers run backward, as by our own will and power to rule and order our hearts. We may as well be our own saviors as our own keepers. And yet Solomon speaks properly enough when he says, Keep thy heart, because the duty is ours, though the power is of God. What power we have depends upon the exciting and assisting strength of Christ. Grace within us is beholden to grace without us. Without me ye can do nothing. So much for the matter of the duty. Number two, the manner of performing it is with all diligence. The Hebrew is very emphatic. Keep with all keeping, or keep, keep, set double guards. This vehemence of expression which of the duty is urged plainly implies how difficult it is to keep our hearts, how dangerous to neglect them. The motive to this duty is very forcible and weighty, for out of the heart are the issues of life. That is, the heart is the source of all vital operations. It is the spring and original of both good and evil, as a spring and a watch that sets all the wheels in motion. The heart is the treasury, the hand and tongue but the shops. What is in these comes from that. The hand and tongue always begin where the heart ends. The heart contrives and the members execute. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil, for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. 
So then, if the heart err in its work, these must miscarry in theirs. For heart errors are like the errors of the first concoction, which cannot be rectified afterward, or like the misplacing and inverting of the stamps and letters in the press, which must cause so many errata in all the copies that are printed. Oh, then, how important a duty is that which is contained in the following proposition. The keeping and right managing of the heart in every condition is one great business of a Christian's life. What the philosophers say of waters is as properly applicable to hearts. It is hard to keep them within any bounds. God has set limits to them, yet how frequently do they transgress not only the bounds of grace and religion, but even of reason and common honesty. This is that which affords the Christian manner of labor and watchfulness to his dying day. It is not the cleaning of the hand that makes the Christian, for many a hypocrite can show as fair a hand as he, but the purifying, watching, and right ordering of the heart. This is the thing that provokes so many sad complaints and costs so many deep groans and tears. It was the pride of Hezekiah's heart that made him lie in the dust, mourning before the Lord. It was the fear of hypocrisies and fading the heart that made David cry, Let my heart be sound in thy statutes, that I be not ashamed. It was a sad experience he had of the divisions and distractions of his own heart in the service of God that made him pour out the prayer, Unite my heart to fear thy name. The method in which I propose to improve the proposition is this. First, I shall inquire what the keeping of the heart supposes and imports. Secondly, assign a number of reasons why Christians must make this a leading business of their lives. Thirdly, point out those seasons which especially call for this diligence in keeping the heart. And fourthly, apply the whole. First, I am to consider what the keeping of the heart supposes and imports. To keep the heart necessarily supposes a previous work of regeneration, which has set the heart right, by giving it a new spiritual inclination. For as long as the heart is not set right by grace as to an habitual frame, no means can keep it right with God. Self is the poise of the unrenewed heart, which biases and moves it in all its designs and actions. And as long as it is so, it is impossible that any external means should keep it with God. God. Man originally was of one constant uniform frame of spirit, held one straight and even course. Not one thought or faculty was disordered. His mind had a perfect knowledge of the requirements of God, his will a perfect compliance therewith. All his appetites and power stood in a most obedient subordination. Man, by the apostasy, has become a most disordered and rebellious creature, opposing his maker as a first cause, or self-dependence as the chief good, by self-love as the highest lord, by self-will, and as the last end, by self-seeking. Thus he is quite disordered, and all his actions are irregular. But by regeneration the disordered soul is set right. This great change being, as the scripture expresses it, the renovation of the soul after the image of God, in which self-dependence is removed by faith, self-love by the love of God, self-will by subjection and obedience to the will of God, and self-seeking by self-denial. The darkened understanding is illuminated, the refractory will sweetly subdued, the rebellious appetite gradually conquered. Thus the soul which sin had universally depraved is by grace restored. This being presupposed, it will not be difficult to apprehend what it is to keep the heart, which is nothing but the constant care and diligence of such a renewed man to preserve his soul in that holy frame to which grace has raised it. For though grace has, in a great measure, rectified the soul and given it an habitual heavenly temper, yet sin often actually discomposes it again, so that even a gracious heart is like a musical instrument, which, though it be exactly tuned, a small matcher brings it out of tune again. Yea, hang it aside but a little, and it will need settling again before another lesson can be played upon it.
If gracious hearts are in a desirable frame in one duty, yet how dull, dead, and disordered when they come to another. Therefore every duty needs a particular preparation of the heart. If thou prepare thine heart, and stretch out thine hands toward him, and so on. To keep the heart, then, is carefully to preserve it from sin, which disorders it, and maintains that spiritual frame which fits it for a life of communion with God. This includes in it six particulars. Number one, frequent observation of the frame of the heart. Carnal and formal persons take no heed to this. They cannot be brought to confer with their own hearts. There are some people who have lived forty or fifty years in the world and have had scarcely one hour's discourse with their own hearts. It is a hard thing to bring a man and himself together on such business, but saints know those soliloquies to be very salutary. The heathen could say, The soul is made wise by sitting still in quietness. Though bankrupts care not to look into their accounts, yet upright hearts will know whether they go backward or forward. I commune with mine own heart, says David. The heart can never be kept until its case be examined and understood. Number two, it includes deep humiliation for heart evils and disorders. Thus Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart. Thus the people were ordered to spread forth their hands to God in prayer, realizing the plague of their own hearts. Upon this account, many an upright heart has been laid low before God. Oh, what an heart have I! Saints have in their confession pointed at the heart, the pain place. Lord, here is a wound. It is with the heart well kept as it is with the eye. If a small dust get into the eye, it will never cease twinkling and watering till it is wept it out. So the upright heart cannot be at rest till it has wept out its troubles and poured out its complaints before the Lord. Number three. It includes earnest supplication and instant prayer for purifying and rectifying grace when sin has defiled and disordered the heart. Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Saints have always many such petitions before the throne of God's grace. This is a thing which is most pleaded by them with God. When they are praying for outward mercies, perhaps their spirits may be more remiss. But when it comes to the heart's case, they extend their spirits to the utmost, fill their mouths with arguments, weep and make supplication. Oh, for a better heart. Oh, for a heart to love God more, to hate sin more, to walk more evenly with God. Lord, deny not to me such a heart. Whatever thou deny me, give me a heart to fear thee, to love and delight in thee, if I beg my bread in desolate places. It is observed of an eminent saint, and when he is, was confessing sin, he would never give over confessing until he had some felt brokenness of heart for that sin, and when praying for any spiritual mercy, would never give over that suit till he had obtained some relish of that mercy. Number four. It includes the imposing of strong engagement upon ourselves to walk more carefully with God and avoid the occasions in which the heart may be induced to sin. While advised and deliberate vows are, in some cases, very useful to guard the heart against some special sin. I have made a covenant with mine eyes, says Job. By this means, holy men have overawed their souls and preserved themselves from defilement. Number five, it includes a constant and holy jealousy over our own hearts. Quick-sighted self-jealousy is an excellent preservative from sin. He that will keep his heart must have the eyes of the soul awake and open upon all the disorderly and tumultuous stirrings of his affections. If the affections break loose and the passions be stirred, the soul must discover it and suppress them before they get to a height. Oh, my soul, dost thou well in this? My tumultuous thoughts and passions, where is your commission? Happy is a man that thus feareth always. By the fear of the Lord it is that men depart from evil, shake off sloth, and preserve themselves from iniquity. He that will keep his heart must eat and drink with fear, rejoice with fear, and pass the whole time of his soul journeying here in fear. All this is little enough to keep the heart from sin." Number six, it includes the realizing of God's presence with us and setting the Lord always before us. This the people have found a powerful means of keeping their heart 
upright and awing them from sin. When the eye of our faith is fixed upon the eye of God's omniscience, we dare not let out our thoughts and affections to vanity. Holy Job durth not suffer his heart to yield to an impure vain thought, and what was it that moved him to so great circumspection? He tells us, Does not he see my ways and count all my steps? In such particulars as these, do gracious souls express the care they have of their hearts. They are careful to prevent the breaking loose of the corruptions in time of temptation, careful to preserve the sweetness and comfort they have got from God in any duty. This is a work, and of all works in religion, it is the most difficult, constant, and important work. Number one, it is the hardest work. Heart work is hard work indeed. To show to shuffle over religious duties with a loose and heedless spirit will cost no great pains, but to set thyself before the Lord and tie up thy loose and vain thoughts to a constant and serious attendance upon him, this will cost thee something. To attain a fa facility and dexterity of language and prayer, and put thy meaning into apt and decent expressions is easy, but to get thy heart broken for sin while thou art confessing it, melted with free grace while thou art blessing God for it, to be really ashamed and humbled through the apprehensions of God's infinite holiness, and to keep thy heart in this frame, not only in but after duty, will surely cost thee some groans and pains of soul. To repress the outward acts of sin and compose the external part of your life in a laudable manner is no great matter. Even carnal persons by the force of common principles can do this, but to kill the root of corruption within, to set up and keep up an holy government over your thought, to have all things lie straight and orderly in the heart, this is not easy. Number two, it is a constant work. The keeping of the heart is a work that is never done till life is ended. There is no time or condition in the life of a Christian which will suffer an intermission of this work. It is in keeping watch over our hearts, and it is with keeping up Moses' hands while Israel and Amalek were fighting. No sooner do the hands of Moses grow heavy and sink down than Amalek prevails. Intermitting the watch over their own hearts but for a few minutes cost David and Peter many a sad day and night. Number three, it is the most important business of a Christian's life. Without this, we are but formalists in religion. All our professions, gifts, and duties signify nothing. My son, give me thine heart, is God's request. God is pleased to call that a gift, which is indeed a debt. He will put this honor upon the creature to receive it from him in the way of a gift. But if this be not given him, he regards not whatever else you bring to him. There is only so much of worth in what we do as there is of heart in it. Concerning the hearts, God seems to say, as Joseph of Benjamin, if you bring not Benjamin with you, you shall not see my face. Among the heathen, when the beast was cut up for sacrifice, the first thing the priest looked upon was the heart, and if that was unsound and worthless, the sacrifice was rejected. God rejects all duties, how glorious soever in other respects, which are offered him without the heart. He that performs duty without the heart, that is heedlessly, is no more accepted with God than he that performs it with the double heart, that is, hypocritically. Thus, I have briefly considered what the keeping of the heart supposes and imports. I proceed, secondly, to assign some reasons why Christians must make this the great business of their lives. The importance and necessity of making this our great business will manifestly appear from several considerations. Number one, the glory of God is much concerned. Heart evils are very provoking evils to the Lord. The schools correctly observe that outward sins are sins of great infamy, but that the heart sins are sins of deeper guilt. How severely has the great God declared his wrath from heaven against heart wickedness? The crime for which the old world stands indicted is heart wickedness. God saw that every imagination of their hearts was only evil, and that continually. For which he sent the most dreadful judgments that were ever inflicted since time began. We find not their murders, adulteries, blasphemies, though they were defiled with these, particularly alleged against them, but the evils of their hearts. That by which God was so provoked as to give up his peculiar inheritance into the enemy's hand was the evil of their hearts. O Jerusalem, wash thine heart from wickedness, that thou mayest be saved. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? 
of the wickedness and vanity of their thoughts, God took particular notice, and because of this the Chaldeans must come upon them, as a lion from his thicket, and tear them to pieces. For the sin of thoughts it was that God threw down the fallen angels from heaven, and still keeps them in everlasting change, to the judgment of the great day. By which expression is not obscurely intimated some extraordinary judgment to which they are reserved, as prisoners that of most iners laid upon them may be supposed to be the greatest malefactors. And what was their sin? Spiritual wickedness. Merely heart evils are so provoking to God that for them he rejects with indignation all the duties that some men perform. He that kills an ox as if he slew a man. He that sacrifices a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offers an oblation as if he offered swine's blood. He that burns incense as if he blessed an idol. In what words could the abhorrence of a creature's actions be more fully expressed by the holy God? Murder and idolatry are not more vile in his account than their sacrifices, though materially such as himself appointed. And what made their sacrifices so vile? The following words inform us, their soul delighted in their abominations. Such is the vileness of men's heart sins that the scriptures sometimes intimate the difficulty of pardon for them. The heart of Simon Magus was not right. He had base thoughts of God and of the things of God. The apostle bade him, Repent and pray, if perhaps the thoughts of his heart might be forgiven him. Oh, then never slight hard evils, for by these God is highly wronged and provoked. For this reason let every Christian keep his heart with all diligence. Number two, the sincerity of our profession much depends upon the care we exercise in keeping our hearts. Most certainly that man who is careless of the frame of his heart is but a hypocrite in his profession, however eminent he be in the externals of religion. We have a striking instance of this in the history of Jehu. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the ways of the Lord God of Israel with his heart. The context gives an account of the great service performed by Jehu against the house of Ahab and Baal, and also of the great temporal reward given him by God for that service even that his children to the fourth generation should sit upon the throne of Israel. Yet in these words, Jehu is censored as a hypocrite, though God approved and rewarded the work, yet he abhorred and rejected the person that did it as hypocritical. Wherein lay the hypocrisy of Jehu? In this, he took no heed to walk in the ways of the Lord with his heart. That is, he did all insincerely and for selfish ends. And though the work he did was materially good, yet he not purging his heart from those unworthy selfish designs in doing it, was a hypocrite. And though Simon Magus appeared such a person that the apostle could not regularly reject him, yet his hypocrisy was quickly discovered. Though he professed piety and associated himself with the saints, he was a stranger to the mortification of heart sins. Thy heart is not right with God. It is true, there is great difference between Christians themselves and their diligence and dexterity about heart work. Some are more conversant with and more successful in it than others, but he that takes no heed to his heart, that is not careful to order it aright before God, is but a hypocrite. And they come unto thee as the people cometh. And they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. Here was a company of formal hypocrites, as is evident from that expression, is my people, like them, but not of them. And what made them so? Their outside was fair. Here were reverent postures, high professions, much seeming delight in ordinances. You are to them as a lovely song, yea, but for all that, they kept not their hearts with God in those duties. Their hearts were commanded by their lusts, they went after their covetousness. Had they kept their hearts with God, all had been well, but not regarding which way their hearts went in duty, there lay the essence of their hypocrisy. If any upright soul should hence infer, I am a hypocrite too, for many times my heart departs from God in duty, do what I can, yet I cannot hold it close with God, I answer the very objection carries in it its own solution. You say, do what I can, yet I cannot keep my heart with God. Soul, if you do what you can, you have the blessing of an upright, though God sees good to exercise thee under the affliction of a discomposed heart. 
there still remains some wildness in the thoughts and fancies of the best to humble them. But if you find a care before to prevent them, and opposition against them when they come, and grief and sorrow afterward, you find enough to clear you from the charge of reigning hypocrisy. This precaution is seen partly in laying up the word in your heart to prevent them. Your word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Partly in your endeavors to engage your heart to God, and partly in begging preventing grace from God in your commencement of duty. It is a good sign to exercise such precaution, and it is an evidence of a brightness to oppose these sins in their first rise. I hate vain thoughts. The spirit lusteth against the flesh. Your grief also discovers the uprightness of your heart. If with Hezekiah you are humble for the evils of your heart, you have no reason from those disorders to question the integrity of it, but to allow sin to lodge quietly in the heart, to let your heart habitually and without control wander from God, is a sad, a dangerous symptom indeed. Number three. The beauty of our conversation arises from the heavenly frame of our spirits. There is a spiritual luster and beauty in the conversation of saints. The righteous is more excellent than his neighbor. Saints shine as the lights of the world, but whatever luster and beauty is in their lives comes from the excellency of their spirits, as a candle within puts luster upon the lantern in which it shines. It is impossible that a disordered and neglected heart should ever produce well-ordered conversation. In sense, as the text observes, the issues or streams of life flow out of the heart as their fountain, it must follow that such as the heart is, the life will be. So in 1 Peter 2.12, abstain from fleshly lusts, having your conversation honest or beautiful, as the Greek would, word imports. So Isaiah 55, 7, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. His way denotes the course of his life, his thoughts the frame of his heart. And therefore, since the course of his life flows from his thoughts, or the frame of his heart both, or neither will be forsaken, the heart is the source of all actions. These actions are virtually and radically contained in our thoughts. These thoughts being once made up into affections are quickly made out into suitable actions. If the heart be wicked, then, as Christ says, out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, and so on. Mark the order. First, wanton or revengeful thoughts, then unclean or murderous practices. And if the heart be holy, then it is as with David. My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is as the pen of a ready writer. Here is a life richly beautified with good work, some ready made. I will speak of the things which I have made. Others making my heart is indicting. Both proceed from the heavenly frame of his heart. Put the heart in frame, and the life will quickly discover that it is so. It is not very difficult to discern by the performances and converse of Christians what frames their spirits are in. Take a Christian in a good frame, and how serious, heavenly, and profitable will his conversation and religious exercises be. What a lovely companion is he during the continuance of it. It would do anyone's heart good to be with him at such a time. The mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom, and his tongue talks of judgment. The law of God is in his heart. When the heart is up with God the, and full of God, how dexterously will he insinuate spiritual discourse, improving every occasion and advantage to some heavenly purpose. Few words then run to waste. And what can be the reason that the discourses and duties of many Christians are becoming so frothy and unprofitable? Their communion both with God and with one another becomes as a dry stock. But this... Their hearts are neglected. Surely this must be the reason of it, and it is an evil greatly to be bewailed. Thus the attracting beauty that was likely to shine from the conversation of the saints upon the faces and consciences of the world, which if it did not allure and bring them in love with the ways of God, at least left a testimony in their consciences of the excellency of those men and of their ways, is in a great measure lost to the unspeakable detriment of religion. Time was when Christians conducted in such a manner that the world stood gazing at them. Their life and language were of a different strain from those of others. Their tongues discovered them to be Galileans wherever they came. But now since vain speculations and fruitless controversies have so much obtained in hard work, 
Practical godliness is so much neglected among professors. The case is sadly altered. Their discourses become like other men's. If they come among you now, they may hear every man speak in his own language. And I have little hope to see this evil redressed and the credit of religion repaired till Christians do their first works, till they apply again to heart work. When the salt of heavenly mindedness is cast into the spring, the streams will run more clear and more sweet. Number four, the comfort of our souls much depends upon the keeping of our hearts. For he that is negligent in attending to his own heart is ordinarily a great stranger to assurance and the comforts following from it. Indeed, if the antinomian doctrine were true, which teaches you to reject all marks and signs for the trial of your condition, telling you that it is the Spirit that immediately assures you by witnessing your adoption directly without them, then you might be careless of your hearts, yea, strange to them, and yet no strangers to comfort. But since both scripture and experience confute this, I hope you will never look for comfort in this unscriptural way. I don't deny that it is a work and office of the Spirit to assure you, yet I confidently affirm that if ever you attain assurance in the ordinary way in which God dispenses it, you must take pains with your own hearts. You may expect your comforts upon easier terms, but I am mistaken if ever you enjoy them upon any other. Give all diligence. Prove yourselves. This is a scriptural method. A distinguished writer in his treatise on the covenant tells us that he knew a Christian who, in the infancy of his Christianity, so vehemently panted after the infallible assurance of God's love, that for a long time together he earnestly desired some voice from heaven, yea, sometimes walking in the solitary fields, earnestly desired some miraculous voice from the trees and stones there. This, after many desires and longings, was denied. But in time a better was afforded in the ordinary way of searching the word and his own heart. An instance of the like nature another learned person gives us of one that was driven by temptation upon the very borders of despair. At last, being sweetly settled and assured, one asked him how he attained it. He answered, Not by any extraordinary revelation, but by subjecting my understanding to the scriptures and comparing my heart with them. The Spirit indeed assures by witnessing our adoption, and He witnesses in two ways. One way is objectively. That is, by producing those graces in our souls which are the conditions of the promise. And so the Spirit and His graces in us are all one. The Spirit of God dwelling in us is a mark of our adoption. Now the Spirit can be discerned not in His essence, but in His operations. And to discern these is to discern the Spirit. And how these can be discerned without serious searching and diligent watching of the heart I cannot imagine. The other way of the Spirit's witnessing is effectively, that is, by irradiating the soul with the grace-discovering light, shining upon his own work, and this, in order of nature, follows a former work. He first infuses the grace, and then opens the eye of the soul to see it. Now, since the heart is a subject of that infused grace, even this way of the Spirit's witnessing includes the necessity of carefully keeping our own hearts. For first, a neglected heart is so confused and dark that the little grace which is in it is not ordinarily discernible. The most accurate and laborious Christians sometimes find it difficult to discover the pure and genuine workings of the Spirit in their hearts. How then shall the Christian, who is comparatively negligent about heart work, be ever able to discover grace? Sincerity, which is the thing sought, lies in the heart like a small piece of gold on the bottom of a river. He that would find it must stay till the water is clear, and then he will see it sparkling at the bottom. That the heart may be clear and settled, how much pains and watching, care and diligence are requisite. Number two, God does not usually indulge negligent souls with the comforts of assurance. He will not so much as seem to patronize loss and carelessness. He will give assurance, but it shall be in his own way. His command has united our care and comfort together. Those are mistaken who think that assurance may be obtained without labor. Ah, how many solitary hours have the people of God spent in hard examination? How many times have they looked into the word and then into their hearts? Sometimes they thought they discovered sincerity, 
and we're even ready to draw forth the triumphant conclusion of assurance, then comes a doubt that they cannot resolve and destroys it all. Many hopes and fears, doubtings and reasonings they have had in their own breasts before they arrived at a comfortable settlement. But suppose it possible for a careless Christian to attain assurance, yet it is impossible for him long to retain it, for it is a thousand to one if those hearts are filled with the joys of assurance. Long retain those joys, unless extraordinary care be used. A little pride, vanity, or carelessness will dash to pieces all that for which they have been a long time laboring in many a weary duty. Since then, the joy of our life, the comforts of our souls, rises and falls with our diligence in this work. Keep your heart with all diligence. Number five. The improvement of our graces depends on the keeping of our hearts. I never knew grace to thrive in a careless soul. The habits and roots of grace are planted in the heart, and the deeper they are rooted there, the more flourishing grace is. In Ephesians 3.17 we read of being rooted in grace. Grace in the heart is the root of every gracious word in the mouth, and of every holy work in the hand. It is true. Christ is the root of a Christian, but Christ is the originating root, and grace a root originated, planted, and influenced by Christ. Accordingly, as this thrives under divine influences, the acts of grace are more or less fruitful or vigorous. Now, in a heart not kept with care and diligence, these fruit-defying influences are stopped and cut off. Multitudes of vanities break in upon it and devour its strength. The heart is, as it were, the enclosure in which multitudes of thoughts are fed every day. A gracious heart, diligently kept, feeds many precious thoughts of God in a day. How precious are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. And as a gracious heart nourishes them, so they refresh and feast the heart. My soul is filled as with marrow and fatness, while I think upon thee, and so on. But in the disregarded heart, multitudes of vain and foolish thoughts are perpetually working, and drive out those spiritual thoughts of God by which the soul should be refreshed. Besides, a careless heart profits nothing by any duty or ordinance it performs or attends upon, and yet these are the conduits of heaven, whence grace is watered and made fruitful. A man may go with a heedless spirit from ordinance to ordinance, abide all his days under the choicest teaching, and yet never be improved by them, for heart neglect is a leak in the bottom. No heavenly influences, however rich, abide in that soul. When the seed falls upon the heart that lies open and common, like the highway, free for all passengers, the fowls come and devour it. Alas! It is not enough to hear unless we take heed how we hear. A man may pray and never be the better unless he watch unto prayer. In a word, all means are blessed to the improvement of grace according to the care and strictness we use in keeping our hearts in them. Number six. The stability of our souls in the hour of temptation depends upon the care we exercise in keeping our hearts. The careless heart is an easy prey to Satan in the hover of temptation. His principal batteries are raised against the heart. If he wins that, he wins all, for it commands the whole man. And alas, how easy a conquest is a neglected heart. It is not more difficult to surprise such a heart than for an enemy to enter that city whose gates are open and unguarded. It is a watchful heart that discovers and suppresses the temptation before it comes to his strength. Theologians observe this to be the method in which temptations are ripened and brought to their full strength. There is the irritation of the object, or that power it has to provoke our corrupt nature, which is neither done by the real presence of the object, or by speculation when the object, though absent, is held out by the imagination before the soul. Then follows a motion of the appetite, which is provoked by the fancy representing it as a sensual good. Then there is a consultation in the mind about the best means of accomplishing it. 
Next follows the election or choice of the will, and lastly the desire or full engagement of the will to it. All this may be done in a few moments, for the debates of the soul are quick and soon ended. When it comes thus far, the heart is won. Satan has entered victoriously and displayed his colors upon the walls of that royal fort, but had the heart been well guarded at first, it had never come to this. The temptation had been stopped in the first or second act, and indeed there it is stopped easily, for it is in the motion of a soul tempted to sin, as in the motion of a stone falling from the brow of a hill. It is easily stopped at first. But when once it is set in motion, it acquires strength by descending. Therefore, it is the greatest wisdom to observe the first motions of the heart, to check and stop the sin there. The motions of sin are weakest at first. A little care and watchfulness may prevent much mischief now. The careless heart not heeding this is brought within the power of temptation, as the Syrians were brought blindfold into the midst of Samaria before they knew where they were. I hope that these considerations satisfy my readers that it is important to keep the heart with all diligence. I proceed, thirdly, to point out those special seasons in the life of a Christian which require our utmost diligence in keeping the heart. Though, as was observed before, the duty is always binding, and there is no time or condition of life in which we may be excused from this work. Yet there are some signal seasons, critical hours, requiring more than common vigilance over the heart. Number one, the first season is a time of prosperity when providence smiles upon us. Now, Christian, keep your heart with all diligence, for it will be very apt to grow secure, proud, and earthly. To see a man humble in prosperity, says Bernard, is one of the greatest rarities in the world. Even a good Hezekiah could not hide a vainglorious temper in his temptation. Hence that caution to Israel, And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware to thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and so on, then beware lest thou forget the Lord. So indeed it happened, for Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. How then may a Christian keep his heart from pride and carnal security under the smiles of providence and the confluence of creature comfort? There are several helps to secure the heart from the dangerous snares of prosperity. Number one, consider the dangerous ensnaring temptations attending a pleasant and prosperous condition. Few, very few of those that live in the pleasures of this world escape everlasting perdition. It is easier, says Christ, for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not many mighty, not many noble are called. We have great reason to tremble when the scripture tells us in general that few shall be saved, much more when it tells us that of that rank of which we are, but few shall be saved. When Joshua called all the tribes of Israel to cast lots for the discovery of Achan, doubtless Achan feared. When the tribe of Judah was taken, his fear increased. But when the family of the Zarhites was taken, it was time to tremble. So when the scriptures come so near as to tell us that of such a class of men very few shall shall escape, it is time to be alarmed. I should wonder, says Chrysostom, if any of the rulers be saved. Oh, how many have been wheeled to hell in the chariots of earthly pleasures, while others have been whipped to heaven by the rod of affliction. How few, like the daughter of Tyre, come to Christ with a gift. How few among the rich entreat his favor. Number two, it may keep one more humble and watchful in prosperity to consider that among Christians many have been much the worse for it. How good it had been for some of them if they had never known prosperity, when they were in a low condition, how humble, spiritual, and heavenly they were. But when advanced, what an apparent alteration has been upon their spirits. It was so with Israel, when they were in a low condition in the wilderness, and Israel was holiness to the Lord. But when they came into Canaan and were richly fed, their language was, We are lords, we will come no more unto thee. Outward gains are ordinarily attended with inward losses, as in a low condition their civil employments were like to have a savor of their religious duties, so in an exalted condition their duties commonly have a savor of the world. He indeed is rich in grace, whose graces are not hindered by his riches. There are but few Jehoshaphats in the world, of whom it is said he had silver and gold in abundance, and his heart was lifted up in the way of God's commands. 
Will not this keep thy heart humble in prosperity, to think how dearly many godly men have paid for their riches, that through them they have lost that which all the world cannot purchase? Number three. Keep down your vain heart by this consideration. God values no man the more for these things. God values no man by outward excellencies, but by inward graces. They are the internal ornaments of the Spirit, which are of a great price in God's sight. God despises all worldly glory and accepts no man's person. But in every nation he that fears God and works righteousness is accepted of him. Indeed, if the judgment of God went by the same rule that man's does, he might value ourselves by these things, and stand upon them. But so much every man is as he is in the judgment of God. Does your heart yet swell, and will neither of the former considerations keep it humble? Number four, consider how bitterly many dying persons have bewailed their folly in setting their hearts upon these things, and have wished that they had never known them. How dreadful was the situation of pious Quintus, who died crying out despairingly, When I was in a low condition, I had some hopes of salvation. When I was advanced to be a cardinal, I greatly doubted. But since I came to the popedom, I have no hope at all. An author also tells us a real but sad story of a rich oppressor who had scraped up a great estate for his only son. When he came to die, he called his son to him and said, Son, do you indeed love me? The son answered that. Nature, besides his paternal indulgence, obliged him to that. Then said the father, Express it by this. Hold your finger in the candle as long as I am saying a prayer. The son attempted but could not endure it. Upon that the father broke out into these expressions, You cannot suffer the burning of your finger for me, but to get this wealth I have hazarded my soul for you, and must burn, body and soul, in hell. For your sake your pains would have been but for a moment, but mine will be unquenchable fire. Number five, the heart may be kept humble by considering what a clogging nature earthly things are to us all heartily engaged in the way to heaven. They shut out much of heaven from us at present, though they may not shut us out of heaven at last. If you consider yourself as a stranger in this world, traveling for heaven, you have then as much reason to be delighted with these things as a weary horse has to be pleased with a heavy burden. There was a serious truth in the eth atheistic scoff of Julian, when taken away the Christians' estates, he told them it was to make them more fit for the kingdom of heaven. Number six, is your spirit still vain and lofty? Then urge upon it the consideration of that awful day of reckoning, in which, according to our receipts of mercy, shall be our account for them. I think this should awe and humble the vainest heart that ever was in the breast of a saint. Know for a certainty that the Lord records all the mercies that ever he gave you from the beginning to the end of your life. Remember, O oh my people, from Shittim unto Gilgal, and so on. Yes, they are exactly numbered and recorded in order to an account, and your account will be suitable. To whomsoever much is given of him shall much be required. You are but a steward, and your Lord will come and take an account of you, and what a great account have you to make. You have much of this world in your hands. What swift witness will your mercies be against you, if this be the best fruit of them? Number seven, it is a very humbling reflection that the mercies of God should work otherwise upon my spirit than they used to do upon the spirits of others to whom they come as sanctified mercies from the love of God. Ah, oh Lord, what a sad consideration is this, enough to lay me in the dust when I consider first that thy mercies have greatly humbled them. The higher God has raised them, the Lord they have laid themselves before him. Thus did Jacob, when God had given him much substance. And Jacob said, I am not worthy of the least of your mercies, and all the truth which you have showed your servant, for with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and am now become two bands. Thus also it was with holy David, when God had confirmed the promise to him to build him a house and not reject him as he did Saul. He goes in before the Lord and says, Who am I, and what is my father's house, if you have brought me here? So indeed God required, when Israel brought to him the first fruits of Canaan, they were to say, Assyria and ready to perish was my father, and so on. Do others raise God the higher for his raising them? And the more God raises me, the more shall I abuse him and exalt myself? Oh, how wicked is such conduct as this! Number two, others have freely ascribed the glory of all their enjoyments to God, and magnified not themselves but him for their mercies. 
so says David, let your name be magnified in the house of your servant be established. He does not fly upon the mercy and suck out his sweetness, looking no further than his own comfort. No, he cares for no mercy except God be magnified in it. So when God had delivered him from all his enemies, he says, The Lord is my strength and my rock. He has become my salvation. Saints of old did not put the crown upon their own heads, as I do by my vanity. Number three, the mercies of God have been melting mercies unto others, melting their souls in love to the God of their mercies. When Hannah received the mercy of a son, she said, My soul rejoices in the Lord, not in the mercy, but in the God of the mercy. So also Mary, My soul doth magnify the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. The word signifies to make more room for God. Their hearts were not contracted, but the more enlarged to God. Number four, the mercies of God have been greater strength to keep others from sin. Seeing thou, our God, hast given us such a deliverance as this, should we again break your commandments. Ingenuous souls have felt the force of the obligations of love and mercy upon them. Number five, the mercies of God to others have been as oil to the wheels of their obedience and made them more fit for service. Now, if mercies work contrarily upon my heart, what cause have I to be afraid that they come not to me in love? It is enough to damp the spirits of any saint to see what sweet effects mercies have had upon others and what bitter effects upon him. Section 2. The second season in the life of a Christian, requiring more than common diligence to keep his heart, is a time of adversity. When providence frowns upon you and blasts your outward comforts, then look to your heart. Keep it with all diligence from repining against God or fainting under his hand, for troubles, though sanctified, are trouble still. Jonah was a good man, and yet how frightful was his heart under affliction. Job was a mirror of patience, yet how was his heart discomposed by trouble. You will find it hard to get a composed spirit under great afflictions. Oh, the hurries and tumults which they occasion even in the best hearts. Let me show you, then, how a Christian under great afflictions may keep his heart from repining or desponding under the hand of God. I will here offer several helps to keep the heart in this condition. Number one, by these cross providences, God is faithfully pursuing the great design of electing love upon the souls of his people, and orders all these afflictions as means sanctified to that end. Afflictions come not by casualty, but by counsel. By this counsel of God, they are ordained as means of much spiritual good to say, by this shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged, and so on. But he for our profit, and so on. All things work together for good, and so on. They are God God's workmen upon our hearts to pull down the pride and carnal security of them, and being so, their nature is changed, they are turned into blessings and benefits. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, says David. Truly, then, you have no reason to quarrel with God, but rather to wonder that he should concern himself so much in your good as to use any means for accomplishing it. Paul could bless God if by any means he might attain the resurrection of the dead. My brethren, says James, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. My father is about a design of love upon my soul, and do I well to be angry with him? All that he does is in pursuance of, and in reference to some eternal glorious sins upon my soul. It is my ignorance of God's design that makes me quarrel with him. He says to you in this case, as he did to Peter, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Number two, though God has reserved to himself a liberty of afflicting his people, yet he has tied up his own hands by promise never to take away his loving kindness from them. Can I contemplate this scripture with a repining, discontented spirit? I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of man, and with the stripes of the children of men. Nevertheless, my mercy shall not depart away from him. Oh, my heart, my haughty heart, dost thou well to be discontent when God has given you the whole tree with all the clusters of comfort growing on it, because he suffers the wind to blow down a few leaves? Christians have two kinds of goods, the goods of the throne and the goods of the footstool. Immovables and movables. If God has secured those, never let your heart be troubled at the loss of these. Indeed, if he had cut off his love or discovenanted my soul, I had reason to be cast down, but this he has not done, nor can he do it. Number three. 
It is of great efficacy to keep the heart from sinking under afflictions, to call to mind that your own Father has the ordering of them. Not a creature moves hand or tongue against you, but by his permission. Suppose the cup be bitter, yet it is the cup which your Father has given you, and can you suspect poison to be in it? Foolish man, put home the case to your own heart. Can you give your child that which would ruin him? No, you would as soon hurt yourself as him. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does God? The very consideration of his nature as a God of love, pity, and tender mercies, or of his relation to you as a father, husband, friend, may be security enough, if he had not spoken a word to quiet you in this case. And yet you have his word, too, by the prophet Jeremiah, I will do you no hurt. You lie too near his heart for him to hurt you. Nothing grieves him more than your groundless and unworthy suspicions of his designs. We did not grieve a faithful, tender-hearted physician when he had studied the case of his patient and prepared the most excellent medicines to save his life, to hear him cry out, Oh, he has undone me, he has poisoned me, because it pains him in the operation. Oh, then will you be ingenuous? Number four, God respects you as much in a low as in a high condition, and therefore for it need not so much trouble you to be made low, nay, he manifests more of his love, grace, and tenderness in the time of affliction than in the time of prosperity. If God did not at first choose you because you were high, he will not now forsake you because you were low. Men may look shy upon you and alter their respects as your condition is altered. When providence has blasted your estate, your summer friends may grow strange, fearing you may be troublesome to them. But will God do so? No. No, I will never leave you nor forsake you, says he. If adversity and poverty could bar you from access to God, it were indeed a deplorable condition. But so far from this, you may go to him as freely as ever. My God will hear me, says the church. Poor David, when stripped of all earthly comforts, could encourage himself in the Lord his God. And why cannot you? Suppose your husband or son had lost all his say and should come to you in rags, could you deny the relation or refuse to entertain him? If you would not, much less will God. Why then are you so troubled? Though your condition be changed, your father's love is not changed. Number five, what if by the loss of outward comforts God preserves your soul from the ruining power of temptation? Surely then you have little cause to sink your heart by such sad thoughts. Do not earthly enjoyments make men shrilly and warp in times of trial? For the love of these, many have forsaken Christ in such an hour. The young ruler went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. If this is God's design, how ungrateful to murmur against him for it. We see mariners in a storm can throw overboard the most valuable goods to preserve their lives. We know it is usual for soldiers in a besieged city to destroy the finest buildings without the walls in which the enemy may take shelter, and no one doubts that it is wisely done. Those who have mortified limbs willingly stretch them out to be cut off, and not only thank, but pay the surgeon. Must God be murmured against for casting over that which would sink you in a storm, for pulling down that which would assist your enemy in the siege of temptation, for cutting off what would endanger your everlasting life? O oh, inconsiderate, ungrateful man, are not these things for which you grieve, the very things that have ruined thousands of souls? Number six, it would much support your heart under adversity to consider that God, by such humbling providences, may be accomplishing that for which you have long prayed and waited. And should you be troubled at that, say, Christian, have you not many prayers descending before God upon such accounts as these, that he would keep you from sin, discover to you the emptiness of the creature, and that he would mortify and kill your lusts? that your heart may never find rest in any enjoyment by Christ. By such humbling and impoverishing strokes, God may be fulfilling your desire. Would you be kept from sin? Lo, he has hedged up your way with thorns. Would you see the creature's vanity? Your affliction is a fair glass to discover it, for the vanity of the creature is never so effectually and sensibly discovered as in our own experience. Would you have your corruptions mortified? This is a way to have the food and fuel removed that maintains them. For as prosperity begat and fed them, so adversity, when sanctified, is a means to kill them. Would you have your heart rest nowhere but in the bosom of God? What better method could providence take to accomplish your desire than pulling from under your head that soft pillow of creature comforts on which you rested before? And yet you fretted this. 
Peevish child, how do you try your father's patience? If he delay to answer your prayers, you are ready to say he does not regard you. If he does that which really answers the end of them, though not in the way in which you expect, you murmur against him for that, as if instead of answering he were crossing all your hopes and aims. Is this ingenuous? Is it not enough that God is so gracious as to do what you desire? Must you be so impudent as to expect him to do it in the way in which you prescribe? Number 7. It may support your heart to consider that in these troubles God is performing that work in which your soul would rejoice if you did see the design of it. We are clouded with much ignorance and are not able to discern how particular providences tend to the fulfillment of God's designs. And therefore, like Israel in the wilderness, are often murmuring because providence leads us about in a howling desert where we are exposed to difficulties, though then he led them and is now leading us by the right way to a city of habitation. If you could but see how God in his secret counsel has exactly laid the whole plan of your salvation, even to the smallest means and circumstances, could you but discern the admirable harmony of divine dispensations, their mutual relations, together with the general respect they all have to the last end, had you liberty to make your own choice, you would, of all conditions in the world, choose that in which you are now. Providence is like a curious piece of tapestry made of a thousand shreds, which, single, appear useless, but put together they represent a beautiful history to the eye. As God does all things according to the counsel of his own will, of course this is ordained at the best method to effect your salvation. Such a one has a proud heart, so many humbling providences appointed for him. Such a one has an earthly heart, so many impoverishing providences for him. Did you but see this? I need say no more to support the most dejected heart. Number eight. It would much conduce to the settlement of your heart to consider that by fretting and discontent you do yourself more injury than all your afflictions could do. Your own discontent is that which arms your troubles with a sting. You make your burden heavy by struggling under it. Did you but lie quietly under the hand of God, your condition would be much more easy than it is. Impatience in the sick occasions severity in the physician. This makes God afflict the more, as a father, a stubborn child that receives not correction. Beside, it unfits the soul to pray over its troubles or receive the sense of that good which God intends by them. Affliction is a pill which, being wrapped up in patience and quiet submission, may easily be swallowed, but discontent chews a pill and so embitters the soul. God throws away some comfort which he saw would hurt you, and will you throw away your peace after it? He shoots an arrow which sticks in your clothes and was never intended to hurt, but only to drive you from sin, and will you thrust it deeper to the pure? of your very heart by despondency and discontent? Number nine, if thy heart, like that of Rachel, still refuses to be comforted, then do one thing more. Compare the condition you are in, and with which you are so much dissatisfied, with the condition in which others are in, and which you deserve to be. Others are roaring in flames, howling under the scourge of vengeance, and among them I deserve to be. O oh, my soul, is this hell? Is my condition as bad as that of the damned? What would thousands now in hell give to exchange conditions with me? I have read, says an author, that when the Duke of Clund had voluntarily subjected himself to the inconveniences of poverty, he was one day observed and pitied by a lord of Italy, who from tenderness wished him to be more careful of his person. The good duke answered, Sir, be not troubled, and think not that I suffer from want, for I send a harbinger before me, who makes ready my lodgings, and takes care that I be royally entertained. The lord asked him who was his harbinger. He answered, The knowledge of myself, and the consideration of what I deserve for my sins which is eternal torment. When with this knowledge I arrive at my lodging, however unprovided I find it, methinks it is much better than I deserve. Why does a living man complain? Thus the heart may be kept from desponding or repining under adversity. Section 3 
The third season calling for more than ordinary diligence to keep the heart is the time of Zion's troubles. When the church, like the ship in which Christ and his disciples were, is oppressed and ready to perish in the ways of persecution, then good souls are ready to be shipwrecked too upon the billows of their own fears. It is true most men need the spur rather than the reins in this case, yet some men sit down discouraged under a sense of the church's troubles. The loss of the ark cost Eli his life. The sad posture in which Jerusalem lay made good Nehemiah's countenance change in the midst of all the pleasures and accommodations of the court. But though God allows, yea, commands the most awakened apprehensions of these calamities, and in such a day calls to mourning, weeping, and girding with sackcloth, and severely threatens the insensible, yet it will not please him to see you sit like pensive Elijah under the juniper tree. Ah, oh, Lord God, it is enough. Take away my life also. No, a mourner in Zion you may not too be, but a self-tormentor you must not be. Complain to God you may, but complain of God though but by the language of your actions you must not. Now let us inquire how tender hearts may be relieved and supported when they are even overwhelmed with the burdensome sense of Zion's troubles. I grant it is hard for him who prefers Zion to his chief joy to keep his heart that it sink not below the due sense of his troubles. Yet this ought to and may be done by the use of such heart-establishing directions as these. Number one. Settle this great truth in your heart, that no trouble befalls Zion, but by the permission of Zion's God, and he permits nothing out of which he will not ultimately bring much good to his people. Comfort may be derived from reflections on the permitting as well as on the commanding will of God. Let him alone, it may be God has bidden him. You could have no power against me except that were given you from above. It should much calm our spirits that it is the will of God to suffer it, and that, had he not suffered it, it could never have been as it is. This very consideration quieted Job, Eli, David, and Hezekiah, that the Lord did it was enough to them, and why should it not be so to us? If the Lord will have Zion plowed as a field, and her goodly stones lie in the dust, if it be his pleasure that Antichrist shall rage yet longer, and wear out the saints of the Most High, if it will be his will that a day of trouble, and of treading down and of perplexity by the Lord God of hosts shall be upon the valley of vision, that the wicked shall devour the man that is more righteous than he? What are we that we should contend with God? It is fit that we should be resigned to that will whence we proceeded, and that he that made us should dispose of us as he pleases. He may do what seems him good without our consent." Does poor man stand upon equal ground that he may capitulate with his creator, or that God should render him an account of any of his measures, that we be content, however God may dispose of us, is as reasonable as that we be obedient, whatever he may require of us? But if we pursue this argument further, and consider that God's permissions all meet at last in the real good of his people, this will much more quiet our spirits. Do the enemies carry away the best among the people into captivity? This looks like a distressing providence, but God sends them there for their good. Does God take the Assyrian as a stay in his hand to beat his people with? The end of his so doing is that he may accomplish his whole work upon Mount Zion. If God can bring much good out of the greatest evil of sin, much more out of temporal afflictions, and that he will is as evident as that he can do so, for it is inconsistent with the wisdom of a common agent to permit anything which he might prevent if he please to cross his great design. And can it be imagined that the most wise God should do so? As then Luther said to Melanchthon, so I say to you, let infinite wisdom, power, and love alone. For by these all creatures are swayed, and all actions guided in reference to the church. It is not our work to rule the world, but to submit to him that does. The motions of providence are all judicious, the wheels are full of eyes. It is enough that the affairs of Zion are in a good hand. Number two, ponder this heart-supporting truth. How many troubles soever are upon Zion, yet her king is in her. What, has the Lord forsaken his churches? Has he sold them into the enemy's hands? Does he not regard what evil befalls him, that our heart sinks thus? Is it not shamefully undervaluing the great God, and too much magnifying poor impotent man to fear and tremble at creatures, while God is in the midst of us? The church's enemies are many and mighty. Let them be granted. Yet that argument would 
with which Caleb and Joshua strove to raise their own hearts is as much force now as it was then. The Lord is with us, fear them not. A historian tells us that when Antagonus overheard his soldiers reckoning how many of their enemies were, and so discouraging one another, he suddenly stepped in among them with this question, And how many do you reckon me for? Discouraged souls, how many do you reckon the Lord for? Is he not an overmatch for all his enemies? Is not one Almighty more than many mighties? If God be for us, who can be against us? What, think you, was the reason of that great examination Gideon made? He questions, he desires a design, and after that, another. And what was the end of all this, but that he might be sure the Lord was with him, and that he might but write this motto upon his ensign, Sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So if you can be well assured the Lord is with his people, you will thereby rise above all your discouragements. And that he is so, you need not require a sign from heaven, lo, you have a sign before you, even their marvelous preservation amidst all their enemies. If God be not with his people, how is it that they are not swallowed up quickly? Do their enemies lack malice, power, or opportunity? No, but there is an invisible hand upon them. Let then his presence give us rest, and though the mountains be hurled into the sea, though heaven and earth mingle together, fear not. God is in the midst of Zion. She shall not be moved. Number three, consider the great advantages attending the people of God in an afflicted condition. If a low and, and afflicted state in the world be really best for the church, then your dejection is not only irrational, but ungrateful. Indeed, if you estimate the happiness of the church by its worldly ease, splendor, and prosperity, then such times of affliction will appear to be unfavorable. But if you reckon its glory to consist in its humility, faith, and heavenly mindedness, no condition so much abounds with advantages for these as an afflicted condition. It was not persecutions and prisons, but worldliness and wantonness that poisoned the church. Neither was it the earthly glory of its professors, but the blood of its martyrs that was the seed of the church. The power of godliness did never thrive better than in affliction, and was never less thriving than in times of greatest prosperity, when we were left a poor and an afflicted people. Then we learned to trust in the name of the Lord. It is indeed for the saints' advantage to be weaned from love of and delight in instant snaring earthly vanities, to be quickened and urged forward with more haste to heaven, to have clearer discoveries of their own hearts, to be taught to pray more fervently, frequently, spiritually, to look and long for the rest to come more ardently. If these be for their advantage, experience teaches us that no condition is ordinarily blessed with such fruits as these, like an afflicted condition. Is it well, then, to repine and droop, because your father consults the advantage of your soul rather than the gratification of your humors? Because he will bring you to heaven by a nearer way than you are willing to go? Is this a due requital of his love, who is pleased so much to concern himself in your welfare, who does more for you than he will do for thousands in the world, upon whom he will not lay a rod, dispense an affliction to them for their good? But alas, we judge by sense, and reckon things good or evil according to our present taste. Number four, take heed that you overlook not the many precious mercies which the people of God enjoy amidst all their trouble. It is a pity that our tears on account of our trouble should so blind our eyes that we should not see our mercies. I will not insist upon the mercy of having your life given you for a prey, nor upon the many outward comforts which you enjoy, even above what were enjoyed by Christ and his precious servants, of whom the world was not worthy. But what say you to pardon of sin, interest in Christ, the covenant of promise, and an eternity of happiness in the presence of God? After a few days are over, oh, that a people entitled to such mercies as these should droop under any temporal affliction, or be so much concerned for the frowns of men and the loss of trifles. You have not the smiles of great men, but you have the favor of the great God. You are perhaps diminished in temporal, but you are thereby increased in spiritual and eternal goods. You cannot live so plentifully as before, but you may live as heavenly as ever. Will you grieve so much for these circumstances as to forget your substance? Shall light troubles make you forget weighty mercies? Remember the true riches of the church are laid out of the reach of all enemies. What though God do not in his outward dispensations distinguish between his own and others? 
Yea, what though his judgment single out the best and spare the worst? What though an Abel be killed in love, and a Cain survive in hatred, a bloody Dionysius die in his bed, and a good Josiah fall in battle? What though the belly of the wicked be filled with hidden treasures, and the teeth of the saints with gravel stones? Still there is much manner of praise, for electing love has distinguished, though common providence has not. And while prosperity and impunity slay the wicked, even slaying and adversity shall benefit and save the righteous. Number six, believe that how low soever the church be plunged under the waters of adversity, she shall assuredly rise again. Fear not, for as surely as Christ arose the third day, notwithstanding the seal and watch upon him, so surely Zion shall arise out of all her troubles, and lift up her victorious head over all her enemies. There is no reason to fear the ruin of that people who thrive by their losses and multiply by their being diminished. Be not too hasty to bury the church before she is dead. Stay till Christ has tried his skill, before you give her up for lost. The bush may be all in a flame, but shall never be consumed, and that because of the good will of him that dwells in it. Number seven, if you can derive no comfort from any of these considerations, try to draw some out of your very trouble. Surely this trouble of yours is a good evidence of your integrity. Union is a ground of sympathy. If you had not some rich adventure in that ship, you would not tremble as you do when it is in danger. Besides, this frame of spirit may afford you this consolation, that if you are so sensible of Zion's trouble, Jesus Christ is much more sensible of and solicitous about it than you can be, and he will have an eye of faith upon them that mourn for it. Section 4. The fourth season, requiring our utmost diligence to keep our hearts, is a time of danger and public distraction. In such times, the best hearts are too apt to be surprised by slavish fear. If Syria be confederate with Ephraim, how do the hearts of the house of David shake, even as the trees of the wood which are shaken with the wind? When there are ominous signs in the heavens, or the distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, then the hearts of men fail for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Even a Paul may sometimes complain of fightings within when there are fears without. But, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. Saints should be of a more elevated spirit. So was David when his heart was kept in a good frame. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Let none but the servants of sin be the slaves of fear. Let them that have delighted in evil fear evil. Let not that which God has threatened as a judgment upon the wicked ever seize upon the hearts of the righteous. I will send faintness into their hearts in the land of their enemies, and the sound of a shaking leaf shall chase them. What poor spirited men are those to fly at a shaking leaf. A leaf makes a pleasant, not a terrible noise. It makes indeed a kind of natural music. But to a guilty conscience, even the whistling leaves are drums and trumpets. But God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of a sound mind. A sound mind, as it stands there in opposition to fear, is an unwounded conscience, not weakened by guilt. And this should make a man as bold as a lion. I know it cannot be said of a saint, as God said of Leviathan, that he is made without fear. There is a natural fear in every man, and it is as impossible to remove it wholly as to remove the body itself. Fear is perturbation of the mind, arising from the apprehension of approaching danger. And as long as dangers can approach us, we shall find some perturbations within us. It is not my purpose to commend to you a stoical apathy, nor yet to dissuade you from such a degree of cautionary preventive fear as may fit you for trouble and be serviceable to your soul. There is a provident fear that opens our eyes to foresee danger and quickens us to a prudent and lawful use of means to prevent it. Such was Jacob's fear, and such his prudence when expecting to meet his angry brother Esau. But it is the fear of diffidence from which I would persuade you to keep your heart. That tyrannical passion which invades the heart in times of danger distracts, weakens, and unfits it for duty, drives men upon unlawful means, and brings a snare with it. Now let us inquire how a Christian may keep his heart from distracting and tormenting fears in times of great and threatening dangers. There are several excellent rules for keeping the heart from sinful fear when imminent danger threaten us. 
Number two, look upon all creatures as in the hand of God, who manages them in all their emotions, limiting, restraining, and determining them at his pleasure. Get this great truth well settled by faith in your heart, and it will guard you against slavish fears. The first chapter of Ezekiel contains an admirable draft of providence. There you see the living creatures who move the wheels. That is the great revolutions of things here below, coming unto Christ who sits upon the throne to receive new instructions from him. In Revelations 6 chapter, you read of white, black, and red horses, which are but the instruments God employs in executing judgments in the world, as war is pestilence and death. When these horses are prancing and trampling up and down in the world, here is a consideration that may quiet our hearts. God has a reins in his hand. Wicked men are sometimes like mad horses. They would stamp the people of God under their feet, but that the bridle of providence is in their mouths. A lion at liberty is terrible to meet, but who is afraid of a lion in the keeper's hand? Number two, remember that this God, in whose hand are all creatures, is your Father, and is much more tender of you than you are, or can be, of yourself. He that touches you, touches the apple of mine eye. Let me ask the most timorous woman, whether there be not a great difference between the sight of a drawn sword and the hand of a bloody ruffian, and of the same sword in the hand of her own tender husband, as great a difference there is between looking upon creatures by an eye of sense, and then looking on them as in the hand of your God, by an eye of faith, Isaiah 54, 5, is here very appropriate. Thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. He is Lord of all the hosts of creatures. Who would be afraid to pass through an army, though all the soldiers should turn their swords and guns toward him, if the commander of that army were his friend or father, a religious young man being at sea with many other passengers in a gray storm, and they being half dead with fear, he only was observed to be very cheerful, as if he were but little concerned in that danger, one of them demanding the reason of his cheerfulness. Oh, said he, it is because the pilot of the ship is my father. Consider. Christ first is the king and supreme lord over the providential kingdom, and then is your head, husband and friend, and ye will quickly say, Return unto thy rest, O my soul. This truth will make you cease trembling and cause you to sing in the midst of danger. The Lord is king of all the earth. Sing ye praise with understanding. That is, let every one that has understanding of this heart reviving and establishing doctrine of the dominion of our Father over all creatures sing praise. Number three, urge upon your heart the express prohibitions of Christ in this case, and let your heart stand in awe of the violation of them. He has charged you not to fear. We shall hear of wars and commotions, see that you be not terrified, and nothing be terrified by your adversaries. In Matthew 10, and within the compass of six verses, our Savior commands us thrice not to fear men. Does the voice of a man make thee to tremble, and shall not the voice of God? If you are such a timorous spirit, how is it that you fear not to disobey the commands of Jesus Christ? I think the command of Christ should have as much power to calm as the voice of a poor worm to terrify your heart. I, even I, am he that comforts you. Who are you that you should be afraid of a man that shall die, and of the son of man that shall be made as the grass, and forget the Lord your maker? We cannot fear creatures sinfully till we have forgotten God. Did we remember what he is and what he has said, we should not be of such a feeble spirit. Bring yourself, then, to this reflection in times of danger. If I let into my heart the slavish fear of man, I must let out the reverential awe and fear of God, and dare I cast off the fear of the Almighty for the frowns of a man? Shall I lift up proud dust above the great God? Shall I run upon a certain sin to shun a probable danger? Oh, keep your heart by this consideration. Number four. Remember how much needless trouble your vain fears have brought upon you formerly, and has feared continually because of the oppressor, as if he were ready to devour. And where is the fury of the oppressor? He seemed ready to devour, yet you are not devoured. I have not brought upon you the thing that you feared. You have wasted your spirit, disordered your soul, and weakened your hands to no purpose. You might have all this while enjoyed your peace and possessed your soul in patience. And here I cannot but observe a very deep policy of Satan in managing a design against the soul by these vain fears. I call them vain with reference to the frustration of them by providence. 
but certainly they are not in vain is the end at which Satan aims in raising them. For in this he acts as soldiers do in the siege of a garrison, who to wear out the besieged by constant watchings, and thereby unfit them to make resistance when they storm it in earnest, every night rouse them with false alarms, which though they come to nothing, yet remarkably answer the ultimate design of the enemy. Oh, when will you beware of Satan's devices? Number five, consider solemnly that though the things you fear should really happen, yet there is more evil in your own fear than in the things feared, and that not only is the least evil of sin is worse than the greatest evil of suffering, but is the sinful fear has really more trouble in it than there is in that condition of which you are so much afraid. Fear is both a multiplying and a tormenting passion. It represents troubles as much greater than they are, and so tortures the soul much more than the suffering itself. So it was with Israel at the Red Sea. They cried out and were afraid till they stepped into the water, and then a passage was opened through those waters which they thought would have drowned them. Thus it is with us. We, looking through the glass of carnal fear upon the waters of trouble, the swellings of Jordan, cry out, Oh, they are unaffordable. Me must perish in them. But when we come into the midst of those floods, indeed, we find the promise made good. God will make a way to escape. Thus it was with the blessed martyr when he would have made a trial by putting his finger to the candle and found himself not able to endure that. He cried out, What? Cannot I bear the burning of a finger? How then shall I be able to bear the burning of my whole body tomorrow? But when that morrow came, he could go cheerfully into the flames with the scripture in his mouth. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with you. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burnt. Number six, consult the many precious promises which are written for your support and comfort in all dangers. These are your refuges to which you may fly and be safe when the arrows of danger fly by night and destruction wasteth at noonday. These are particular promises suited to particular cases and exigencies. There are also general promises reaching all cases and conditions such as these. All things shall work together for good, and so on. Though a sinner do evil in hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet it shall be well with them that fear the Lord, and so on. Could you but believe the promises, your heart should be established. Could you but plead them with God as Jacob did, thou sayest, I will surely do thee good, and so on, they would relieve you in every distress. Verse 7. Quiet your trembling heart by recording and consulting your past experiences of the care and faithfulness of God in former distresses. These experiences are food for your faith in a wilderness. By this David kept his heart in time of danger, and Paul his. It was answered by a saint when one told him that his enemies waylaid him to take his life. If God take no care of me, how is it that I have escaped hitherto? You may plead with God old experiences for new ones, for it is in pleading with God for new deliverances as it is in pleading for new pardons. Mark how Moses pleads of that account with God. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people, as you have forgiven them from Egypt until now. He does not say as men do. Lord, this is the first fault. You have not been troubled before to sign their pardon, but, Lord, because you have pardoned them so often, I beseech you pardon them once again. So in new difficulties, let the saints say, Lord, you have often heard, helped, and saved in former years. Therefore, now help again. For with you there is plenteous redemption, and your arm is not shortened. Number A, be well satisfied that you are in the way of your duty, and that will beget holy courage in times of danger. Who will harm you if you be a follower of that which is good? Or if any dare attempt to harm you, you may boldly commit yourself to God in well-doing. It was this consideration that raised Luther's spirit above all fear. In the cause of God, said he, I ever am and ever shall be stout. Herein I assume this title, Yield to None. A good cause will bear up a man's spirit. Hear the saying of a heathen to the shame of cowardly Christians, when the emperor Vespasian had commanded Fluidius Precius not to come to the senate, or if he did come to speak nothing but what he would have him, the senator returned this noble answer. 
quote, that he was a senator, it was fit he should be at the Senate, and if being there he were required to give his advice, he would freely speak that which his conscience commanded him, end quote. The emperor threatening that then he should die, he answered, Did I ever tell you that I was immortal? Do what you will, and I will do what I ought. It is in your power to put me to death unjustly, and in my power to die with constancy, end quote. Righteousness is a brass plate. Let them tremble whom danger finds out of the way of duty. Number nine. Get your consciences sprinkled with the blood of Christ from all guilt, and that will set your heart above all fear. It is guilt upon the conscience that softens and makes cowards of our spirits. The righteous are bold as the lion. It was guilt in Cain's conscience that made him cry, Every one that finds me will slay me. A guilty conscience is more terrified by imagined dangers than a pure conscience is by real ones. A guilty sinner carries a witness against himself in his own booth. Them. It was guilty Herod that cried out, John the Baptist has risen from the dead. Such a conscience is the devil's anvil, on which he fabricates all those swords and spears with which the guilty sinner pierces himself. Guilt is to danger what fire is to gunpowder. A man need not fear to walk among many barrels of powder if he have no fire about him. Number 10. Exercise holy trust in times of great distress. Make it your business to trust God with your life and comforts, and then your heart will be at rest about them. So did David. At what time I am afraid I will trust in thee. That is, Lord, if at any time a storm arise, I will shelter from it under the covert of your wings. Go to God by acts of faith and trust, and never doubt that he will secure you. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you, says Isaiah. God is pleased when you come to him thus. Father, my life, my liberty, and my estate are exposed, and I cannot secure them. Oh, let me leave them in your hand. The poor leaves himself with you, and does his God fail him? No, you are the helper of the fatherless. Thou, that is, you are the helper of the destitute one, that is none to go to but God. This is a comforting passage. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. He does not say his ears shall be preserved from the report of evil things. He may hear his sad tidings as other men, but his heart shall be kept from the terror of those tidings. His heart is fixed. Number 11. Consult the honor of religion more and your personal safety less. Is it for the honor of religion, do you think, that Christians should be as timorous as hares to start at every sound? Will not this tempt the world to think that whatever you talk, yet your principles are no better than other men's? What mischief may the discovery of your fears before them do? It was nobly said by Nehemiah, Should such a man as I flee, and who, being as I am, would flee? Were it not better you should die than that the world should be prejudiced against Christ by your example? For alas, how apt is a world who judge more by what they see in your practices than by what they understand of your principles to conclude from your timidity that how much soever you commend faith and talk of assurance, yet you dare trust to those things no more than they when it comes to the trial. Oh, let not your fears lay such a stumbling block before the blind world. Number 12. He that would secure his heart from fear must first secure the eternal interest of his soul in the hands of Jesus Christ. When this is done, you may say, Now, world, do thy worst. You will not be very solicitous about a vile body when you are at once assured it shall be well to all eternity with your precious soul. Fear not them, says Christ, that can kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. The assured Christian may smile with contempt upon all his enemies and say, Is this the worst that you can do? What say you, Christian? Are you assured that your soul is safe, that within a few moments of your dissolution it shall be received by Christ into an everlasting habitation? If you be sure of that, never trouble yourself about the instrument and means of your death. Number 13. Learn to quench all slavish creature fears in the reverential fear of God. This is a cure by diversion. It is an exercise of Christian wisdom to turn those passions of the soul which most predominate into spiritual channels, to turn natural anger into spiritual zeal, natural mirth into holy cheerfulness, and natural fear into a holy dread and awe of God. This method of cure Christ prescribes in the tenth of Matthew, similar to which is Isaiah 8, 12, and 13. Fear not their fear, 
but how shall we help it? Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. Natural fear may be allayed for the present by natural reason, or the removal of the occasion, but then it is like a candle blown out by a puff of breath which is easily blown in again. But if the fear of God extinguish it, then it is like a candle quenched in water, which cannot easily be rekindled. 14. Pour out to God in prayer those fears which the devil and your own unbelief pour in upon you in times of danger. Prayer is the best outlet to fear. Where is the Christian that cannot set his seal to this direction? I will give you the greatest example to encourage you to compliance, even the example of Jesus Christ. When the hour of his danger and death drew nigh, he went into the garden, separated from his disciples, and there wrestled mightily with God in prayer, even unto agony, in reference to which the apostle says, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong cries and tears to him that was able to save from death, and was heard in that he feared. He was heard as to strength and support to carry him through it, though not as to deliverance or exemption from it. Oh, that these things may abide with you, and be reduced to practice in these evil days, and that many trembling may be established by them. Section 5. The fifth season, requiring diligence and keeping the heart, is a time of outward lacks. Although at such times we should complain to God, not of God, the throne of grace being erected for a time of need, yet when the waters of relief run low and lack begins to press, how prone are the best hearts to distrust the fountain. When the meal and the barrel and the oil and the cruise are almost spent, our faith and patience too are almost spent. It is now difficult to keep the proud and unbelieving heart in the holy quietude and sweet submission at the foot of God. It is an easy thing to talk of trusting God for daily bread, while we have a full barn or purse, but to say is the prophet, though the fig tree should not blossom, neither fruit be in the vine, and so on, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Surely this is not easy. Would you know, then, how a Christian may keep his heart from distrusting God or repining against him, when outward wants are either felt or feared? The case deserves to be seriously considered, especially now, since it seems to be the design of providence to empty the people of God of their creature fullness and acquaint them with those difficulties to which before this they have been altogether strangers. To secure the heart from the dangers attending this condition, these considerations may, through the blessing of the Spirit, prove effectual. Number 1. If God reduces you to necessities, he therein deals no otherwise with you than he has done with some of the holiest men that ever lived. Your condition is not singular, though you have before this been a stranger to want. Other saints have been familiarly acquainted with it. Hear what Paul says, not of himself only, but in the name of other saints reduced to like exigencies. Even to the present hour we both hunger and thirst, and are naked and are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place. To see such a man as Paul going up and down the world naked and hungry and homeless, one that was so far above you in grace and holiness, one that did more service for God in a day than perhaps you have done in all your days, may well put an end to your repining. Have you forgotten how much even a David has suffered? How great were his difficulties? Give, I pray thee, says he to Nabal, whatsoever comes to your hand, to your servants, and to your son David. But why speak I of these? Behold, a greater than any of them, even the Son of God, who is the heir of all things, and by whom the worlds were made, sometimes would have been glad of anything, having nothing to eat. And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing a fig tree afar off, leaving leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. Hereby, then, God has set no mark of hatred upon you, neither can you infer lack of love from lack of bread. When your repining heart puts the question, Was there ever sorrow like unto mine? Ask these worthies, and they will tell thee that though they did not complain as thou dost, yet their condition was as necessitous as thine is. Number two, if God leave you not in this condition without a promise, you have no reason to repine or despond under it. 
This is a sad condition indeed, to which no promise belongs. Calvin, in his comment on Isaiah 9, 1, explains in what sense the darkness of the captivity was not so great as that of the lesser incursions made by Tiglath, Pileser. In the captivity, the city was destroyed and the temple burnt with fire. There was no comparison in the affliction, yet the darkness was not so great, because, says he, there was a certain promise made in this case, but none in the other. It is better to be as low as hell with a promise than to be in paradise without one. Even the darkness of hell itself would be no darkness comparatively at all were there but a promise to enlighten it. Now God has left many sweet promises for the faith of his poor people to live upon in this condition such as these. O oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no lack to them that fear him. The lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that fear the Lord shall not lack any good thing. The eye of the Lord is upon the righteous to keep them alive in famine. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. He that feared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? When the poor and the needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue fails for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. Here, you see, the extreme wants, water being put for their necessities of life and their certain relief. I, the Lord, will hear them, in which it is supposed that they cry unto him in their distress, and he hears their cry. Having therefore these promises, why should not your distrustful heart conclude like David's, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But these promises imply conditions. If they were absolute, they would afford more satisfaction. What are those tacit conditions of which you speak but these, that he will either supply or sanctify your wants, that she shall have so much as God sees fit for you? And does this trouble you? Would you have the mercy, whether sanctified or not, whether God sees it fit for you or not? The appetites of saints after earthly things should not be so ravenous as to seize greedily upon any enjoyment without regarding circumstances. But when wants press, and I see not whence supply should come, my faith in the promise shakes, and I, like murmuring Israel, cry, He gave bread, can He give water also? O oh, unbelieving heart, when did His promises fail? Whoever trusted them and was ashamed, may not God upbraid you with thine unreasonable infidelity, as in Jeremiah 2.31? Have I been a wilderness to you? Or as Christ said to his disciples, Since I was with you, lacked you anything? Yea, may you not upbraid yourself, may you not say with good old Polycarp, These many years I have served Christ and found him a good master. Indeed, he may deny what your wantonness desires, but not what your want calls for. He will not regard the cry of your lusts, nor yet despise the cry of your faith. Though he will not indulge your want and appetite, yet he will not violate his own faithful promises. These promises are your best security for eternal life, and it is strange that they should not satisfy you for daily bread. Remember the words of the Lord and solace your heart with them amidst all your wants. It is said of Epicurus that in a dreadful paroxysm of the colic, he often refreshed himself by calling to mind his inventions in philosophy. In Apocidonius, a philosopher, that in an acute disorder he solaced himself with discourses on moral virtue, and when distressed he would say, O oh, pain, thou dost nothing. Though thou art a little troublesome, I will never confess thee to be evil. If upon such grounds as these they could support themselves under such racking pains and even deluded their diseases by them, how much rather should the promises of God and the sweet experiences which have gone along step by step with them make you forget all your wants and comfort you in every difficulty? Number three, if it be bad now, it might have been worse. Has God denied you the comforts of this life? He might have denied you Christ peace and pardon also, and then your case had been woeful indeed. You know, God has done so to millions. How many such wretched objects may your eyes behold every day that have no comfort in hand, nor yet in hope, that are miserable here, and will be so to eternity, that have a bitter cup, and nothing to sweeten it, no, not so much as any hope that it will be better. But it is not so with you, though you be poor in this world, yet you are rich in faith and an heir of the kingdom which God has promised. 
Learn to set spiritual riches over against temporal poverty. Balance all your present troubles with your spiritual privileges. Indeed, if God has denied your soul the robe of righteousness to clothe it, the hidden manna to feed it, the heavenly mansion to receive it, you might well be pensive. But the consideration that he has not may administer comfort under any outward distress. When Luther began to be pressed by lack, he said, Let us be contented with our hard fare. For do not we feast upon Christ, the bread of life? Blessed be God, said Paul, who has abounded to us in all spiritual blessings. Number four, though this affliction be great, God has far greater, with which he chastises the dearly beloved of his soul in this world. Should he remove this and inflict those, you would account your present state a very comfortable one, and bless God to be as you now are. Should God remove your present troubles, supply all your outward wants, give you the desire of your heart and creature comforts, but hide his face from you, shoot his arrows into your soul, and cause the venom of them to drink up your spirit, should he leave you but a few days to the buffetings of Satan, should he hold your eyes but a few nights, waking with horrors of conscience, tossing to and fro till the dawning of the day, should he lead you through the chambers of death, show you the visions of darkness, and make his terrors set themselves in array against you, then tell me if you would not think it a great mercy to be back again in your former necessitous condition, with peace of conscience, and account bread and water, with God's favor, a happy state. Oh, then take heed of repining. Say not that God deals hardly with you, lest you provoke him to convince you by your own sins that he has worse rods than these for unsubmissive and forward children. Number five. If it be bad now, it will be better shortly. Keep your heart with this consideration. The meal in the barrel is almost spent. Well, be it so, why should that trouble me? If I am almost beyond the need and use of these things, the traveler has spent almost all his money. Well, says he, though my money be almost spent, my journey is almost finished, too. I am near home, and shall soon be fully supplied. If there be no candles in the house, it is a comfort to think that it is almost day, and then there will be no need of them. I am afraid, Christian, you misreckon when you think your provision is almost spent, and you have a great way to travel, many years to live and nothing to live upon. It may be not half so many as you suppose. In this be confident, if your provision be spent, either fresh supplies are coming, though you do not see from where, or you are nearer your journey's end than you reckon yourself to be. Desponding soul, does it become a man traveling upon the road to that heavenly city, and almost arrive there, within a few days? journey of his father's house, where all his wants shall be supplied, to be so anxious about a little meat or drink or clothes which he fears he shall want by the way. It was nobly said by the forty martyrs when turned out naked in a frosty night to be starved to death. The winter indeed is sharp and cold, but heaven is warm and comfortable. Here we shiver for cold, but Abraham's bosom will make amends for all. But, says the desponding soul, I may die for want. Whoever did so, when were the righteous forsaken? If indeed it be so, your journey is ended, and you shall be fully supplied. But I am not sure of that. Were I sure of heaven, it would be another manner. Are you not sure of that? Then you have other matters to trouble yourself about than these. Methinks these should be the least of all your cares. I do not find that souls perplexed about the want of Christ, pardon of sin, and so on, are usually very solicitous about these things. He that seriously puts such questions as these, What shall I do to be saved? How shall I know my sin is pardoned? Does not trouble himself with, What shall I eat? What shall I drink? Or wherewithal shall I be clothed? Number six, does it become the children of such a father to distrust his all-sufficiency or repine at any of his dispensations? Do you well to question his care and love upon every new exigency? Say, have you not formerly been ashamed of this? Has not your father's seasonable provision for you in former difficulties put you to the blush and made you resolve never more to question his love and care? And yet will you again renew your unworthy suspicions of him? Disingenuous child, reason thus with yourself. If I perish for want of what is good and needful for me, 
It must be either because my father knows not my wants, or has not wherewith to supply them, or regards not what becomes of me. Which of these shall I charge upon him? Not the first, for my father knows what I have need of. Not the second, for the earth is the Lord's, and the fatness thereof. His name is God all-sufficient. Not the last, for as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. The Lord is exceeding pitiful and of tender mercy. He hears the young ravens when they cry, and will he not hear me? Consider, says Christ, the fowls of the air, not the fowls at the door that are fed every day by hand, but the fowls of the air that have none to provide for them. Does he feed and clothe his enemies, and will he forget his children? He heard even the cry of Ishmael in distress. Oh, my unbelieving heart, do you yet doubt? Number seven, your poverty is not your sin, but your affliction. If you have not by sinful means brought in upon yourself, and if it be not but an affliction, it may the more easily be borne. It is hard indeed to bear an affliction coming upon us as a fruit and punishment of sin. When men are under trouble on, upon that account, they say, Oh, if it were but a single affliction coming from the hand of God by way of trial, I could bear it. But I have brought it upon myself by sin. It comes as a punishment of sin. The marks of God's displeasure are upon it. It is the guilt within that troubles and galls more than the lack without. But it is not so here. Therefore you have no reason to be cast down under it. But though there be no sting of guilt, yet this condition wants not other stings, as, for instance, the discredit of religion. I cannot comply with my engagements in the world, and thereby religion is likely to suffer. It is well you have a heart to discharge every duty, yet if God disable you by providence, it is no discredit to your profession that you do not that which you cannot do, so long as it is your desire and endeavor to do what you can and ought to do. And in this case, God's will is that lenity and forbearance be exercised towards you. But it grieves me to behold the necessities of others, whom I was wont to relieve and refresh, but now cannot. If you cannot, it ceases to be your duty, and God accepts the drawing out of your soul to the hungry and compassion and desire to help them, though you cannot draw forth a full purse to relieve and supply them. But I find such a condition full of temptations, a great hindrance in the way to heaven. Every condition in the world has its hindrances and attending temptations, and were you in a prosperous condition, you might there meet with more temptations and fewer advantages than you now have. For though I confess poverty as well as prosperity has its temptations, yet I am confident prosperity is not those advantages that poverty has. Here you have an opportunity to discover the sincerity of your love to God, when you can live upon Him, find enough in Him, and constantly follow Him, even when all external inducements and motives fail. Thus I have shown you how to keep your heart from the temptations and dangers attending a low condition in the world. When want oppresses and the heart begins to sink, then improve and bless God for these helps to keep it. Section 6 the sixth season, requiring this diligence that came in the heart, is a season of duty. Our hearts must be closely watched and kept when we draw near to God in public, private, or secret duties, for the vanity of the heart seldom discovers itself more than at such times. How often does a poor soul cry out, O oh Lord, how gladly would I serve you, but vain thoughts will not let me. I come to open my heart to you, to delight my soul in communion with you, but my corruptions oppose me. Lord, call off these vain thoughts, and suffer them not to estrange the soul that is espoused to you. The question then is this, how may the heart be kept from distractions by vain thoughts in times of duty? There is a twofold distraction or wandering of the heart in duty. First, a voluntary and habitual. They set not their hearts aright, and their spirit was not steadfast with God. This is a case of formalists and it proceeds from the want of a holy inclination of the heart to God. Their hearts are under the power of their lusts, and therefore it is no wonder that they go after their lusts, even when they are about holy things. Secondly, involuntary and lamented distractions. I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. O oh, wretched man that I am! And so on. This proceeds not from want of a holy inclination or aim, but from the weakness of grace and the want of vigilance and opposing indwelling sin. 
But it is not my business to show you how these distractions come into the heart, but rather how to get them out and prevent their future admission. First, sequester yourself from all earthly employments and set apart some time for solemn time to meet God in duty. You cannot come directly from the world into God's presence without finding the savor of the world in your duties. It is with the heart, a few minutes since plunged in the world, now in the presence of God, as it is with the sea after a storm, which will, still continues working, muddy and disquiet, though the wind be laid and the storm be over. Your, your heart must have some time to settle. Few musicians can take an instrument and play upon it without some time and labor to tune it. Few Christians can say with David, My heart is fixed. O oh God, it is fixed. When you go to God in any duty, take your heart aside and say, O oh my soul, I am now engaged in the greatest work that a creature was ever employed about. I am going into the awful presence of God upon business of everlasting moment. O oh, my soul, leave trifling now, be composed, be watchful, be serious. This is no common work. It is soul work. It is work for eternity. It is work which will bring forth fruit to life or death in the world to come. Pause a while and consider your sins, your wants, your troubles. Keep your thoughts a while on these before you address yourself to duty. David first mused and then spoke with his tongue. Number two, having composed your heart by previous meditation, immediately set a guard upon your senses. How often are Christians in danger of losing the eyes of their mind by those of their body? Against this, David prayed, Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity, and quicken thou me in thy way. This may serve to expound the Arabian proverb, Shut the windows that the house may be light. It were well if you could say in the commencement, as the holy man once said when he came from the performance of duty, Be shut, O oh my eyes, be shut, for it is impossible that you should ever discern such beauty and glory in any creature as I have now seen in God. You must avoid all occasions of distraction from without, and imbibe that intenseness of spirit in the work of God which locks up the eye and ear against vanity. Number three, beg of God a mortified fancy. A working fancy, says one, how much soever it be extolled among men, is a great snare to the soul, except it work in fellowship with right reason and a sanctified heart. The fancy is a power of the soul, placed between the senses and the understanding. It is that which first stirs itself in the soul, and by its motions the other powers of the soul are brought into exercise. It is that in which thoughts are first formed, and as that is, so are they. If imaginations be not first cast down, it is impossible that every thought of the heart should be brought into obedience to Christ. The fancy is naturally the wildest and most untamable power of the soul. Some Christians have much to do with it, and the more spiritual the heart is, the more does a wild and vain fancy disturb and perplex it. It is a sad thing that one's imagination should call off the soul from attending on God when it is engaged in communion with Him. Pray earnestly and perseveringly that your fancy may be chastened and sanctified, and when this is accomplished, your thoughts will be regular and fixed. Number four, if you would keep your heart from vain excursions when engaged in duties, realize to yourself, by faith, the awful presence of God. If the presence of a grave man would compose you to seriousness, how much more should the presence of a holy God? Do you think that you would dare to be gay and light if you realize the presence and inspection of the divine being? Remember where you are when engaged in religious duty, and act as if you believed in the omniscience of God. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Realize his infinite holiness, his purity, his spirituality. Strive to obtain such apprehensions of the greatness of God as shall suitably affect your heart, and remember his jealousy over his worship. This is that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. A man that is praying, says Bernard, should behave himself as if he were entering into the court of heaven, where he sees the Lord upon his throne, surrounded with ten thousand of his angels and saints ministering to him. When you come from an exercise in which your heart has been wandering and listless, 
what can you say? Suppose all the vanities and impertinences which have passed through your mind during a devotional exercise were written down and interlined with your petitions. Could you have the face to present them to God? Should your tongue utter all the thoughts of your heart when attending the worship of God? Would not men abhor you? Yet your thoughts are perfectly known to God. Oh, think upon this scripture. God is greatly to be feared in the assemblies of his saints, and to be had in reverence of all them that are round about him. Why did the Lord descend in thunderings and lightnings and dark clouds upon Sinai? Why did the mountain smoke under him, the people quake and tremble round about him? Moses himself not accepted. But to teach the people this great truth, let us have grace, whereby we may serve him acceptably, with with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Such apprehensions of the character and presence of God will quickly reduce a heart inclined to vanity to a more serious frame. Number five, maintain a prayerful frame of heart in the intervals of duty, where reasons can be assigned why our hearts are so dull, so careless, so wandering when we hear or pray, but there have been long intermissions in our communion with God. If that divine unction, that spiritual fervor, and those holy impressions which we obtain from God while engaged in the performance of one duty were preserved to enliven and engage us in the performance of another, they would be of incalculable service to keep our hearts serious and devout. For this purpose, frequent ejaculations between stated and solemn duties are of most excellent use. They not only preserve the mind in a composed and pious frame, but they connect one stated duty, as it were, with another, and keep the attention of the soul alive to all its interests and obligations. Number six. If you would have the distraction of your thoughts prevented, endeavor to raise your affections to God and to engage them warmly in your duty. When the soul is intent upon any work, it gathers in its strength and bends all its thoughts to that work. And when it is deeply affected, it will pursue its object with intenseness. The affections will gain an ascendancy over the thoughts and guide them. But deadness causes distraction, and distraction increases deadness. Could you but regard your duties as the medium in which you might walk in communion with God, in which your soul might be filled with those ravishing and matchless delights which his presence affords, you might have no inclination to neglect them. But if you would prevent the recurrence of distracting thoughts, if you would find your happiness in the performance of duty, you must not only be careful that you engage in what is your duty, but labor with patient and persevering exertion to interest your feelings in it. Why is your heart so inconstant, especially in secret duties? Why are you ready to be gone almost as soon as you are come into the presence of God, but because your affections are not engaged? Number seven. When you are disturbed by vain thoughts, humble yourself before God and call in assistance from heaven. When the messenger of Satan buffeted Paul by wicked suggestions, as is supposed, he mourned before God on account of it. Never slight wandering thoughts and duty is small matters. Follow every such thought with a deep regret. Turn to God with such words as these. Lord, I come here to commune with you. And here a busy adversary and a vain heart conspiring together have opposed me. Oh my God, what a heart have I, that it shall never wait upon you without distraction. When shall I enjoy an hour of free communion with you? Grant me your assistance at this. Discover your glory to me, and my heart will quickly be recovered. I come here to enjoy you, and shall I go away without you? Behold my distress, and help me. Could you but sufficiently bewail your distractions, and repair to God for deliverance from them, you would gain relief. Number 8. Look upon the success and the comfort of your duties as depending very much upon the keeping of your hearts close with God in them. There are two things the success of duty and the inward comfort arising from the performance of it are unspeakably dear to the Christian, but both of these will be lost if the heart be in a listless state. Surely God hears not vanity, nor does the Almighty regard it. The promise is made to a heart engaged. 
Then shall you seek me and find me, when you shall search for me with all your hearts. When you find your heart under the power of deadness and distraction, say to yourself, Oh, what do I lose by a careless heart now? My praying seasons are the most valuable portions of my life. Could I but raise my heart to God, I might now obtain such mercies as would be manner of praise to all eternity. Number 9. Regard your carefulness or carelessness in this manner as a great evidence of your sincerity or hypocrisy. Nothing will alarm an upright heart more than this. What shall it give way to a customary wandering of the heart from God? Shall the spot of the hypocrite appear upon my soul? Hypocrites indeed can drudge on in the round of duty, never regarding the frame of their hearts, but shall I do so? Never. Never let me be satisfied with empty duties. Never let me leave off from duty until my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Number 10. It will be of special use to keep your heart with God in duty, to consider what influences all your duties will have upon your eternity. Your religious seasons are your seed times, and in another world you must reap the fruits of what you sow in your duties here. If you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption. If you sow to the spirit, you will reap life everlasting. Answer seriously these questions. Are you willing to reap the fruit of vanity in the world to come? Dare you say, when your thoughts are roving to the ends of the earth in duty, when you scarce mind what you say or hear, now, Lord, I am sowing to the Spirit, now I am providing and laying up for eternity, now I am seeking for glory, honor, and immortality, now I am striving to enter in at the straight gate, now I am taking the kingdom of heaven by holy violence. Such reflections are well calculated to dissipate vain thoughts. Session 7. The seventh season, which requires more than common diligence to keep the heart, is when we receive injuries and abuses from men. Such is the depravity and corruption of man that one has become as a wolf or a tiger to another. And as men are naturally cruel and oppressive one to another, so the wicked conspire to abuse and wrong the people of God. The wicked devoureth a man that is more righteous than he. Now when we are thus abused and wronged, it is hard to keep the heart from revengeful motions, to make it meekly and quietly commit the cause to him that judges righteously, to prevent the exercise of any sinful affection. The spirit that is in us lusteth to revenge, but it must not be so. We have choice helps in the gospel to keep our hearts from sinful motions against our enemies, and to sweeten our embittered spirits. Do you ask how a Christian may keep his heart from revengeful motions under the greatest injuries and abuses from men. I reply, when you find your heart begin to be inflamed by revengeful feelings, immediately reflect on the following things. Number one, urge upon your heart the severe prohibitions of revenge contained in the law of God. However gratifying to your corrupt propensities revenge may be, remember that it is forbidden. Hear the word of God. Say not, I will recompense evil. Say not, I will do so to him as he has done to me. Recompense no man evil for evil. Avenge not yourselves, but give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. It was an argument urged by the Christians to prove their religion to be supernatural and pure, that it forbids revenge, which it is so agreeable to nature, and it is to be wished that such an argument might not be laid aside. Awe your heart, then, with the authority of God in the Scriptures, and when carnal reason says, My enemy deserves to be hated, let conscience reply, But does God deserve to be disobeyed? Thus and thus hath he done, and so hath he wronged me. But what has God done that I should wrong him? If my enemy dares boldly to break the peace, shall I be so wicked as to break the precept? If he fears not to wrong me, shall I not fear to wrong God? Thus let the fear of God restrain and calm your feelings. Number two, set before your eyes the most imminent patterns of meekness and forgiveness, that you may feel the force of their example. This is a way to cut off the common pleas of flesh and blood for revenge, as thus no man would bear such an affront. Yes, others have borne as bad and worse ones. But I shall be reckoned a coward, a fool, if I pass by this. No matter so long as you follow the examples of the wisest and holiest of men. Never did anyone suffer more or greater abuses from men than Jesus did, nor did anyone ever endure insult and reproach and every kind of abuse in a more peaceful and forgiving manner. 
When he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. When his murderers crucified him, he prayed, Father, forgive them. And herein he has set us an example that we should follow his steps. Thus his apostles imitated him. Being reviled, say they, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. I have often heard it reported of the holy Mr. Dodd that when a man enraged at his close convincing doctrine assaulted him, smote him on the face, and dashed out two of his teeth, that meek servant of Christ spit out the teeth and blood into his hand and said, See here, you have knocked out two of my teeth, and that without any just provocation. But on condition that I might do your soul good, I would give you leave to knock out all the rest. Here was exemplified the excellency of the Christian spirit. Strive then for the spirit which constitutes the true excellence of Christians. Do what others cannot do. Keep the spirit in exercise, and you will preserve peace in your own soul and gain the victory over your enemies. Number two, consider the character of the person who has wronged you. He is either a good or a wicked man. If he is a good man, there is light and tenderness in his conscience, which sooner or later will bring him to a sense of the evil of what he has done. If he is a good man, Christ has forgiven him greater injuries than he has done to you. And why should you not forgive him? Will Christ not abrade him for any of his wrongs, but frankly forgive them all? And will you take him by the throat for some petty abuse? which he has offered you. But if a wicked man has injured or insulted you, truly you have more reason to exercise pity than revenge towards him. He is in a deluded and miserable state, a slave to sin and an enemy to righteousness. If he should ever repent, he will be ready to make you reparation. If he continues impenitent, there is a day coming when he will be punished to the extent of his deserts. You need not study revenge. God will execute vengeance upon him. Number four, remember that by revenge you can only gratify a sinful passion, which by forgiveness you might conquer. Suppose that by revenge you might destroy one enemy, yet by exercising the Christian's temper you might conquer three enemies, your own lust, Satan's temptation, and your enemy's heart. If by revenge you should overcome your enemy, the victory would be unhappy and inglorious, for in gaining it you would be overcome by your own corruption. But by exercising a meek and forgiving temper, you will always come off with honor and success. It must be a very disingenuous nature, indeed, upon which meekness and forgiveness will not operate. That must be a flinty heart which this fire will not melt. Thus David gained such a victory over Saul, his persecutor, that Saul lifted up his voice and wept, and he said to David, Thou art more righteous than I. Number five. Seriously propose this question to your own heart. Have I got any good by means of the wrongs and injuries which I have received? If they have done you no good, turn your revenge upon yourself. You have reason to be filled with shame and sorrow, that you should have a heart which can deduce no good from such troubles, that your temper should be so unlike that of Christ. The patience and meekness of other Christians have turned all the injuries offered to them to a good account. Their souls have been animated to praise God when they have been loaded with reproaches from the world. I thank my God, said Jerome, that I am worthy to be hated of the world. But if you have derived any benefit from the reproaches and wrongs which you have received, if they have put you upon examining your own heart, if they have made you more careful how you conduct, if they have convinced you of the value of a sanctified temper, will you not forgive them? Will you not forgive one who has been instrumental of so much good to you? What, though he meant it for evil? If through the divine blessing your happiness has been promoted by what he has done, why should you even have a hard thought of him? Number six. Consider by whom all your troubles are ordered. This will be of great use to keep your heart from revenge. This will quickly calm and sweeten your temper. When Shimei railed at David and cursed him, the spirit of that good man was not at all poisoned by revenge. For when Abishai offered him, if he pleased, a head of Shimei, the king said, Let him curse, because the Lord has said to him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore have you done so? It may be that God uses him as his rod to chastise me, because by my sin I gave the enemies of God occasion to blaspheme. And shall I be angry with the instrument? How irrational were that! Thus Job was quieted. He did not rail and meditate revenge upon the Chaldeans and Sabaeans, but regarded God as the orderer of his troubles, and said, The Lord has taken away. Blessed be his name. 
Number seven, consider how you are daily and hourly wronging God, and you will not be so easily inflamed with revenge against those who have wronged you. You are constantly affronting God, yet he does not take vengeance on you, but bears with you and forgives. And will you rise up and avenge yourself upon others? Reflect on this cutting rebuke. O oh, thou wicked and slothful servant, I forgave you all that debt because you desired me. Should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant, even as I had pity on you? None should be so filled with forbearance and mercy to such as wrong them, as those who have experienced the riches of mercy themselves. The mercy of God to us should melt our hearts into mercy towards others. It is impossible that we should be cruel to others, except we forget how kind and compassionate God has been to us. And if kindness cannot prevail in us, methinks fear should. If you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Number 8. Let the consideration that the day of the Lord draws nigh restrain you from anticipating it by acts of revenge. Why are you so hasty? Is not the Lord at hand to avenge all his abused servants? Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth, and so on. Be ye also patient, for the coming of the Lord draws nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge stands at the door. Vengeance belongs to God, and will you wrong yourself so much as to assume his work? Section 8. The next season in which special exertion is necessary to keep the heart is when we meet with great trials. In such cases the heart is apt to be suddenly transported with pride, impatience, or other sinful passions. Many good people are guilty of hasty and very sinful conduct in such instances, and all have need to use diligently the following means to keep their hearts submissive and patient under great trials. Number 1. Get humble and abasing thoughts of yourself. The humble is ever the patient patient man. Pride is the source of irregular and sinful passions. A lofty will be an unyielding and peevish spirit. When we overrate ourselves, we think that we are treated unworthily, that our trials are too severe, thus we cavil and repine. Christian, you should have such thoughts of yourselves as would have put a stop to these murmurings. You should have lower and more humiliating views of yourself than any other one can have of you. Get humility and you will have peace, whatever be your trial. Number two, cultivate a habit of communion with God. This will prepare you for whatever may take place. This will so sweeten your temper and calm your mind as to secure you against surprises. This will produce that inward peace which will make you superior to your trials. Habitual communion with God will afford you enjoyment, which you can never be willing to interrupt by sinful feeling. When a Christian is calm and submissive under his afflictions, probably he derives support and comfort in this way. But he who is discomposed Opposed, impatient, or fretful, shows that all is not right within. He cannot be supposed to practice communion with God. Number three, let your mind be deeply impressed with an apprehension of the evil nature and erects of an unsubmissive and restless temper. It grieves the Spirit of God and induces His departure. His gracious presence and influence are enjoyed only where peace and quiet submission prevail. The indulgence of such a temper gives the adversary an advantage. Satan is an angry and discontented spirit. He finds no rest but in restless hearts. He bestirs himself when the spirits are in a commotion. Sometimes he fills the heart with ungrateful and rebellious thoughts. Sometimes he inflames the tongue with indecent language. Again, such a temper brings guilt upon the conscience, unfits the soul for any duty, and dishonors a Christian name. Oh, keep your heart and let the power and excellence of your religion be chiefly manifested when you are brought into the greatest straits. Number four, consider how desirable it is for a Christian to overcome his evil propensities, how much more present happiness it affords, how much better it is in every respect to mortify and subdue unholy feelings than to give way to them. When upon your deathbed you come calmly to review your life, how comfortable will it be to reflect on the conquests which you have made over the depraved feelings of your heart? It was a memorable saying of Valentinian the emperor when he was about to die, amongst all my conquests there is but one that now comforts me. Being asked what that was, he answered, I have overcome my worst enemy, my own sinful heart. Number five, shame yourself by contemplating the character of those who have been most eminent for meekness and submission. 
Above all, compare your temper with the Spirit of Christ. Learn of me, saith he, for I am meek and lowly. It is said of Calvin and Ursin, though both of choleric natures, that they had so imbibed and cultivated the meekness of Christ as not to utter an unbecoming word under the greatest provocations. And even many of the heathens have manifested great moderation and forbearance under their severest afflictions. Is it not a shame and a reproach that you should be outdone by them? Number six, avoid everything which is calculated to irritate your feelings. It is true spiritual valor to keep as far as you can out of sin's way. If you can but avoid the excitements to impetuous and rebellious feelings or check them in their first beginnings, you will have but little to fear. The first workings of common sins are comparatively weak. They gain their strength by degrees, but in times of trial the motions of sin are strongest at first. The unsubdued temper breaks out suddenly and violently, but if you resolutely withstand it at first, it will yield and give you the victory. Section 9 the ninth season in which the greatest diligence and skill are necessary to keep the heart is the hour of temptation when Satan besets the Christian's heart and takes the unwary by surprise. To keep the heart at such times is not less a mercy than a duty. Few Christians are so skillful in detecting the fallacies and repelling the arguments by which the adversary incites them to sin as to come off safe and whole in these encounters. Many eminent saints have smarted severely for their lack of watchfulness and diligence at such times. How, then, may a Christian keep his heart from yielding to temptation? There are several principal ways in which the adversary insinuates temptation and urges compliance. Number one, Satan suggests that here is pleasure to be enjoyed. The temptation is presented with a smiling aspect and an enticing voice. What, are you so dull and phlegmatic as not to feel the powerful charms of pleasure? Who can withhold himself from such delights? Reader, you may be rescued from the danger of such temptations by repelling the proposal of pleasure. It is urged that the commission of sin will afford you pleasure. Suppose this were true, will the accusing and condemning rebukes of conscience and the flames of hell be pleasant too? Is there pleasure in the scourges of conscience? If so, why did Peter weep so bitterly? Why did David cry out of broken bones? You hear what is said of the pleasure of sin, and have you not read what David said of the effects of it? Thine arrow stick fast in me, and your hand presses me sore. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin, and so on. If you yield to temptation, you must feel such inward distress on account of it, or the miseries of hell. But why should the pretended pleasures of sin allure you, when you know that unspeakable, more real pleasure will arise from the mortification than can arise from the commission of sin? Will you prefer the gratification of some unhallowed passion with the deadly poison which it will leave behind to that sacred pleasure which arises from hearing and obeying God, complying with the dictates of conscience and maintaining inward peace? Can sin afford any such delight as he feels who by resisting temptation has manifested the sincerity of his heart and obtained evidence that he fears God, loves holiness, and hates Sin. Number two, the secrecy with which you may commit sin is made use of to induce compliance with temptation. The tempter insinuates that this indulgence will never disgrace you among men, for no one will know it. But recollect yourself, does not God behold you? Is not the divine presence everywhere? What if you might hide your sin from the eyes of the world? You cannot hide it from God. No darkness nor shadow of death can screen you from his inspection. Besides, have you no reverence for yourself? Can you do that by yourself which you dare not have others observe? Is not your conscience as a thousand witnesses? Even a heathen could say, when you are tempted to commit sin, fear yourself without any other witness. Number three. The prospect of worldly advantage often enforces temptation. It is suggested, why should you be so nice and scrupulous? Give yourself a little liberty, and you may better your condition. Now is your time. This is a dangerous temptation and must be promptly resisted. Yielding to such a temptation will do your soul more injury than any temporal acquisition can possibly do you good. And what would it profit you if you should gain the whole world and lose your own soul? What can be compared with the value of your spiritual interests? 
or what can it all compensate for the smallest injury of them? Number four, perhaps the smallest of the sin is urged as a reason why you may commit it. Thus, it is but a little one, a small matter, a trifle, who will stand upon such niceties. What is the majesty of heaven little too? If you commit this sin, you will offend a great God. Is there any little hell to torment little sinners in? No, the least sinners in hell are full of misery. There is great wrath treasured up for those whom the world regards as little sinners. But the less the sin, the less the inducement to commit it. Will you provoke God for a trifle? Will you destroy your peace, wound your conscience, and grieve the spirit all for nothing? What madness is this? Number 5. An argument to enforce temptation is sometimes drawn from the mercy of God in the hope of pardon. God is merciful. He will pass by this as an infirmity. He will not be severe to mark it. But stay, where do you find a promise of mercy to presumptuous sinners? Involuntary reprisals and lamented infirmities may be pardoned, but the soul that doth aught presumptuously, the same reproaches the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people. If God is a being of so much mercy, how can you affront him? How can you make so glorious an attribute as the divine mercy an occasion of sin? We wrong him because he is good. Rather let his goodness lead you to repentance and keep you from transgression. Number six. Sometimes Satan encourages to the commission of sin from the examples of holy men. Thus and thus they sinned and were restored. Therefore you may commit this sin and yet be a saint and be saved. Such suggestions must be instantly repelled. If good men have committed sin similar to that with which you are beset, did any good man ever sin upon such ground and from such encouragement as is here presented? Did God cause their examples to be recorded for your imitation or for your warning? Are they not set up as beacons that you may avoid the rocks upon which they split? Are you willing to feel what they felt for sin? Do you follow them in sin and plunge yourself into such distress and danger as they incurred? Reader, in these ways, learn to keep your heart in the hour of temptation. Section 10 the time of doubting and of spiritual darkness constitutes another season when it is very difficult to keep the heart. When the light and comfort of the divine presence is withdrawn, when the believer from the prevalence of indwelling sin in one form or other is ready to renounce his hopes, to infer desperate conclusions with respect to himself, to regard his former comforts as vain delusions and his professions as hypocrisy, is such a time much diligence is necessary to keep the heart from despondency. The Christian's distress arises from his apprehension of a spiritual state, and in general he argues against his possessing true religion, either from his having relapsed into the same sins from which he had formerly been recovered with shame or sorrow, or from the sensible declining of his affections from God, or from the strength of his affections toward creature enjoyments, or from his enlargement in public, while he is often confined and barren in private duties, or from some horrible suggestions of Satan, with which his soul is greatly perplexed, or lastly, from God's silence and seeming denial of his long-depending prayers. Now, in order to the establishment and support of the heart under these circumstances, it is necessary that you be acquainted with some general truths which have a tendency to calm the trembling and doubting soul, and that you be rightly instructed with regard to the above-mentioned causes of disquiet. Let me direct your attention to the following general truths. Number one, every appearance of hypocrisy does not prove the person who manifests it to be a hypocrite. You should carefully distinguish between the appearance and the predominance of hypocrisy. There are remains of deceitfulness in the best hearts. This is exemplified in David and Peter, but the prevailing frame of their hearts being upright, they were not denominated hypocrites for their conduct. Number two, we ought to regard what can be said in our favor as well as what may be said against us. It is the sin of upright persons sometimes to exercise an unreasonable severity against themselves. They do not impartially consider the state of their souls. To make their state appear better than it really is, indeed, is the damning sin of self-flattering hypocrites, and to make their state appear worse than it really is, is the sin and folly of some good persons. But why should you be such an enemy to your own peace? 
Why read over the evidences of God's love to your soul as a man does a book which he intends to confute? Why do you study evasions and turn off those comforts which are due to you? Number three, everything which may be an occasion of grief to the people of God is not a sufficient ground for their questioning the reality of their religion. Many things may trouble which ought not to stumble you. If upon every occasion you should call in question all that had ever been wrought upon you, your life would be made up of doubtings and fears, and you could never attain that settled inward peace and live that life of praise and thankfulness which the gospel requires. Number four, the soul is not at all times in a suitable state to pass a right judgment upon itself. It is peculiarly unqualified for this in the hour of desertion or temptation. Such seasons must be improved rather for watching and resisting than for judging and determining. Number five, whatever be the ground of one's distress, it should drive him to, not from, God. Suppose you have sinned thus and so, or that you have been thus long and sadly deserted, yet you have no right to infer that you ought to be discouraged as if there was no help for you in God. When you, when you have well digested these truths, if your doubts and distress remain, consider what is now to be offered. Number one. Are you ready to conclude that you have no part in the favor of God because you were visited with some extraordinary affliction? If so, do you then rightly conclude that great trials are tokens of God's hatred? Does the scriptures teach this? And dare you infer the same with respect to all who have been as much or more afflicted than yourself? If the argument is good in your case, it is good in application to theirs, and more conclusive with respect to them, in proportion as their trials were greater than yours. Woe then to David, Job, Paul, and all who have been afflicted as they were. But should you passed along in quietness and prosperity, had God withheld these chastisements with which he ordinarily visits his people, would you not have had far more reason for doubts and distress than you now have? Number two, do you rashly infer that the Lord has no love to you because he has withdrawn the light of his countenance? Do you imagine your state to be hopeless because it is dark and uncomfortable? Be not hasty in forming this conclusion. If any of the dispensations of God to his people will bear a favorable as well as a harsh construction, why should they not be construed in the best sense? And may not God have a design of love rather than of hatred in the dispensation under which you mourn? May he not depart for a season without departing forever? You are not the first that have mistaken the design of God in withdrawing himself. Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. My Lord hath forgotten me. But was it so? What saith the answer of God? Can a woman forget her sucking child? And so on. But do you sink down under the apprehension that the evidences of a total and final desertion are discoverable in your experience? Have you then lost your conscientious tenderness with regard to sin? And are you inclined to forsake God? If so, you have reason indeed to be alarmed. But if your conscience is tenderly alive, if you are resolved to cleave to the Lord, if the language of your heart is, I cannot forsake God. God. I cannot live without his presence. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Then you have reason to hope that he will visit you again. It is by these exercises that he still maintains his interest in you. Once more, are sense and feeling suitable to judge of the dispensations of God by? Can their testimony be safely relied on? Is it safe to argue thus? If God had any love for my soul, I should feel it now as well as in former times, but I cannot feel it. Therefore, it is gone. May you not as well conclude when the sun is invisible to you that he has ceased to exist? Read Isaiah 1, verse 10. Now, if there is nothing in the divine dealings with you, which is a reasonable ground of your despondency and distress, let us inquire what there is in your own conduct for which you should be so cast down. Number one, have you committed sins from which you were formerly recovered with shame and sorrow? And do you thence conclude that you sin allowedly and habitually, and that your oppositions to sin were hypocritical? But do not too hastily give up all for lost. Is not your repentance and care renewed as often as you commit sin? Is it not the sin itself which troubles you? And is it not true that the oftener you sin, the more you are distressed? Is it not so in customary sinning of which Bernard excellently discourses thus? When a man accustomed to restrain sins grievously, it seems insupportable to him. 
yet he seems to descend alive into hell. In process of time, it seems not insupportable, but heavy. And between insupportable and heavy, there is no small descent. Next, such sinning becomes light. His conscience smites, but faintly, and he regards not her rebukes. Then he is not only insensible to his guilt, but that which was bitter and displeasing has become in some degree sweet and pleasant. Now it is made a custom, and not only pleases, but pleases habitually. At length, custom becomes nature. He cannot be dissuaded from it, but defends and pleads for it. This is allowed and customary sinning. This is the way of the wicked. But is not your way the contrary of this? Number two, do you apprehend a decline of your affections from God and from spiritual subjects? This may be your case, and yet there may be hope. But possibly you are mistaken with regard to this. There are many things to be learned in Christian experience. It has relation to a great variety of subjects. You may now be learning what it is very necessary for you to know as a Christian. Now what if you are not sensible of so lively affections of such ravishing views as you had at first? May not your piety be growing more solid and consistent and better adapted to practical purposes? Does it follow from your not always being in the same frame of mind? or from the fact that the same objects do not at all times excite the same feelings that you have no true religion? Perhaps you deceive yourself by looking forward to what you would be rather than contemplating what you are compared with what you once were. Number three. If the strength of your love to creature enjoyments is a ground of desperate conclusions respecting yourself, perhaps you argue thus, I fear that I love the creature more than God. If so, I have not true love to God. I sometimes feel stronger affections toward earthly comforts than I do toward heavenly objects. Therefore, my soul is not upright within me. If indeed you love the creature for itself, if you make it your end, and religion but a means, and you conclude rightly, for this is incompatible with supreme love to God. But may not a man love God more ardently and unchangeably than he does anything or all things else? And yet when God is not the direct object of his thoughts, may he not be sensible of more violent affection for the creature than he has at that time for God? His rooted malice indicates a stronger hatred than sudden, though more violent passion. So we must judge of our love, not by violent motion of it now and then, but by the depth of its root and the constancy of its exercise. Perhaps your difficulty results from bringing your love to some foreign and improper test. Many persons have feared that when brought to some imminent trial, they should renounce Christ and cleave to the creature. But when the trial came, Christ was everything, and the world is nothing in their esteem. Such were the fears of some martyrs whose victory was complete. But you may expect divine assistance only at the time of and in proportion to your necessity. If you would try your love, see whether you are willing to forsake Christ now. Number four, is a lack of that enlargement in private which you find in public exercises an occasion of doubts and fears? Consider then whether there are not some circumstances attending public duties which are peculiarly calculated to excite your feelings and elevate your mind, and which cannot affect you in private. If so, your exercises in secret, if performed faithfully and in suitable manner, may be profitable, though they have not at all the characteristics of those in public. If you imagine that you have spiritual enlargement and enjoyment in public exercises while you neglect private duties, doubtless you deceive yourself. Indeed, if you live in the neglect of secret duties or are careless about them, you have great reason to fear. But if you regularly and faithfully perform them, it does not follow that they are vain and worthless, or that they are not of great value because they are not attended with so much enlargement as you sometimes find in public. And what if the Spirit is pleased more highly to favor you with this gracious influence in one place and at one time than another? Should this be a reason for murmuring and unbelief or for thankfulness? The vile or blasphemous suggestions of Satan sometimes occasion great perplexity and distress. They seem to lay open an abyss of corruption in the heart, and to say there can be no grace here. But there may be grace in the heart where such thoughts are injected, though not in the heart which consents 
to and cherishes them, do you then abhor and oppose them? Do you utterly refuse to give up yourself to their influence and to strive to keep holy and reverent thoughts of God and of all religious objects? If so, such suggestions are involuntary and no evidence against your piety.